try to be as human as possible, and I try to understand that you two are doing this work. So I ask you that if you want to communicate with us, that you open up the communication in full transparency and sincerity and express if you are feeling that way, I'll allow that in this platform. You can certainly say, this is how I'm feeling, and um, give me a moment, or I need more time, and I'll get back to you. You can certainly talk that way. No one here is, um, should feel that way. No one here should feel disrespected or pushed or, um, or whatever anxieties that build around that. So <clears throat> I hope that this sets precedence to how we should do government. And our, hopefully that um, we can build our relationships um, in that way. Um, does anyone have anything to say before we begin? All right, cool. Um, I hope you can appreciate my openness and ability to talk to you just straight up. We're here to do the work. We all care about this work, and we know that you do too. All right, thank you. <clears throat> oh, so, sorry, the, the point of that, <laughs> right, is that um, the majority of the counselors at this point are people of color, and asking these questions are difficult. Putting the pressure on is difficult. Um, and so the fact that people feel comfortable to call it disrespect or rude is in itself a trigger for me as a black woman and for my colleagues. Um, with that, I would, I would challenge you, I would implore you to tell us right here in the chamber exactly how you're feeling and I will do my best to make sure that I'm holding myself accountable when I am uh, doing whatever it is that makes you feel in that way. But let's do it all in, out in the open. That's it. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Tanya Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov for slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. The Council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment uh, to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. Attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at each departmental hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. Uh, the full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated to public testimony are or was one on April 26th at 6 p.m. and the next one will be on June 2nd at 6 p.m. You will give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtual via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation um, and residence and limit your comments to two minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. Email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Submit a two minute video of your testimony through the form <clears throat> on our website 
For more information on the City Council budget process and how to testify, please visit the City Council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Sorry, boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on dockets 0480-20482. Orders for the FY23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental oper operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits, OPEB, dockets 0483. Orders for capital tr fund transfer Appropriations, docket 0484 to 0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements, docket 0487 to 0489, orders for BPS revolving funds. For our focus area for this hearing will be Boston Public Schools operations, including school administration, sorry, school admission and assignment system, BPS transportation, food and nutrition service, services, school safety, admin budget, central office, human capital, including diversity, recruitment, evaluation, staff retention, procurement, BPS revolving funds as well. Our panelists today for today's hearings are uh, Nathan Cooter, Chief Financial Officer, you know, you guys wanted to state your names. I have them all, but you could just uh, state your names. But um, I'll just go to, so we have Indy Alvarez, Fran Johnson, Denise Snyder, Ray Catching, Sam DePina. Please state your name when um, you're doing your um, presentation. I am joined today by my colleagues, Councilor Aaron Murphy, Council at Large, Councilor Liz Braden. Um, help me out. District 9, <laughs> Councillor Kenzie Bach, District 8, <laughs> and Councillor Julia Mejia at large. I will now turn um, the floor over to the administration for their presentation. You guys, please um, introduce yourselves all over again with your, with your uh, titles. And you'll have 20 minutes for your presentation. You know how this goes. Seven minutes, then five, then three, round, and then we wrap it up. Um, that's all I got, no opening statement. Unless anyone uh, wishes to make any opening statements, we'll go straight to presentation. All right, you have the floor. Excellent, good morning, counselors. Um, and thank you for having us here to talk about the FY23 budget. As the counselor mentioned, this um, topic this morning is about our operations budget, including some critical areas of work. Um, and the teams that are here before you all represent teams that have instituted significant change over the last two years. Um, first and foremost, our operations team, including our food, nutrition services, and transportation department, were on the front lines of responding to the pandemic and changing operations on a nearly daily basis. Our food, nutrition services team went from serving meals in schools and cafeterias to rapidly figuring out how to deliver meals to homes um, and have been dealing with the pandemic's effects on recruiting and hiring over the last few years. Our transportation team, again, trying to respond to changing conditions and guidelines from the Public Health Commission, keeping kids safe and getting them on time to school, really representing flexible, adaptive work, I think the kind of thing that you wanna see from government in responding in times. These are critical things for closing opportunity achievement gaps because we need to do our work differently. And I think that's represented by the admissions team, um, the welcome services team, and the way that they have instituted significant change in our exam school policies and tried to be creative in how they reach out to families and make our welcome centers easier to use. And of course, our recruitment cultural diversity teams and human capital teams trying to create a more diverse workforce um, and make sure our schools are staffed on time with the highest qualified candidates. So, Really proud to be standing here with this team and look forward to their um, presentations. As a counselor mentioned, my name is Nate Cooter. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. I'm joined by Ray Ketching, the Deputy Chief of Human Capital, Sam DePina, the Deputy Superintendent for Operations, Indy Alvarez, our Chief of Operations, Fran Johnson, our Deputy Chief of Safety Services, and Denise Snyder, Acting Chief of Family and Community Advancement. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Chief Alvarez um, to walk us through the first few slides. Good morning. Um, 
as Nate just mentioned, sorry, gotta work on my voice here. Um, I am joined today by a few of my um, team members and I wanna just mention them because they played a major role in a lot of the work that we've uh, been doing. First, I wanna mention Deputy COO Teresa Neff Webster, who sat in on the left, uh, Director of Transportation Deliver and Stanislaus, um, Director of Food and Nutrition Services, Deb Venturcelli, and the Executive Director of Facilities, Brian Ford. Just wanna say thank you to each and every one of them because they're the ones who are out there doing a lot of this hard work um, that we're putting forward. Um, the first part of my presentation that I'm gonna go through right now is the Food and Nutrition Services. Um, in FY22, the new investment in kitchens were 69 schools cooking by June 30th um, of 2022. The new model of um, on-site cooking, student choice, and welcoming environment. And the active, they're actively recruiting to make sure that we have all our vacancies uh, filled. For FY23, there are 43 additional schools um, that will be cooking during the fall and winter of 2022 with a total of 112 on-site cooking by February 2023. Um, we're returning to the pre-pandemic USDA reimbursement levels and anticipate increased operating um, costs. There'll be some savings expected from reduced reliance on vended meals and working to increase efficiency and waste reduction through training and technology. Um, we do have, if I'm not mistaken, provided the councils with a um, list of the my Way Cafe kitchens. And as I promised, Nate and the team, I will keep it short and then send it back to the next person. Transportation. So I'm now going to run through the transportation piece of my presentation, which is going off. Um, as part of the Broader City Initiative, VPS is in current um, negotiations as far as our like MBTA uh, T passes and making sure that we are up to date with our MOU. The F20, FY23 budget um, advances the transportation department mission to provide safe, reliable, and on-time transportation for all students of Boston. The FY23 investment, the number of students requiring monitors increased by 70% since FY15. Nine new positions to support this bus, the bus monitor unit has been created. Um, and we're also working on the electrifying our fleet. VPS um, Farmers Transportation plans to purchase 20 electric buses um, for the FY23 as a pilot in a broader city initiative. Um, and 20 type C 71 passenger buses. The transportation department is launching an invitation uh, for bid this summer through the fall for the next bus operator contract, which will begin FY24. The department is continuing to work on a variety of initiatives to improve performance and cost efficiency. And that is my presentation for transmission and for nutrition. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, counselors. My name is Fran Johnson. I'm the deputy chief with safety services. Um, for fiscal year 23, our operating budget is $5.4 million. Our department consists of a chief, deputy chief, two directors, 14 senior specialists, and 31 specialists. Um, our advancement and goals going forward is to increase our staff capacity um, and diversity, constitute reform-minded trainings, expand community engagement partnerships, and continue our collaboration with partners, DYS, DCF, Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, the Mayor's Office of Public Safety, Youth Connect, YLU, and other partners. Good morning, counselors. My name is Denise Snyder. I'm the acting chief for Family and Community Advancement. Um, also with me up in the wings there is Sonia gomez Banre, the Senior Director of Welcome Services. She and her team make the magic happen. So I speak with them um, when I say that the Welcome Services budget supports the operations of four welcome centers with 18 full-time staff collectively, as well as some seasonal temps. 
There are five assignment specialists as well as two analysts who manage the algorithm and the hand assignment process. On our team is also a residency investigator as well as the senior director, an assignment director, and a program manager specific to the new exam school policy implementation. Collectively, this team implements school choice season, school registration, and assignment, and processes more than 16,000 transactions per year. Our staff are diverse. Walk into any welcome center and the staff reflect the community they serve. You can be served in Somali, Arabic, Spanish, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Portuguese, Cape Verdean, Haitian Creole, English, and I know I'm missing a few. As you know, we implement the home-based assignment policy and we do so in rounds. Round one is for transition grades, round two is for K2 and non-transition grades. There's also a round three from April to June for later registrants. And after that, staff manually assign families to the closest school with an available seat, working first from their lists. Having reviewed data on who traditionally comes late to register, we are proud to be launching a new campaign to support non-native English speakers who we've identified as traditionally registering late, typically in August. This is designed to help them understand the value of early registration, support the process with them, and discuss the advantages of being sure to include tier one and tier two schools regardless of proximity. At this point, I will turn it over to Human Capital. Good morning, counselors. My name is Ray Catchings. I'm your Deputy Chief Human Capital Officer for Boston Public Schools. Um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Jillian Kelton, who's our Assistant Director in Safety Services. She's here for ad additional questions, too. Um, and of course, our Acting Director of Recruitment, uh, Cultivation, and Div Diversity, Rashawn Martin. He's uh, going to be uh, a big part of what we talk about today when we talk about what we're doing going forward to continue to increase diversity, the diversity of our workforce. And of course, Mrs. Adriana Hetty, who is um, a super duper data person that helps us <coughs> crunch the numbers um, and make this all uh, help us establish our goals and, and continue to move forward. So first what I'd like to do um, is acknowledge that this is a bit of a pivot <laughs> coming from uh, talking about school assignment but what I'd like to sort of frame for you is that we are looking at uh, what you see here on the slide is the trajectory of uh, where we've come from in diversity of our workforce. Um, and I can talk to you about what our numbers look like uh, compared to the last five years. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to lean on Rashawn to help us uh, talk about what we're doing to come on the other side of the pandemic to continue to diversify our workforce going into the future. Um, so first, I want to call out here that what you're looking at um, is the Garrity Order uh, which a lot of us are familiar with. If you're not, it's, it's a nice leisure read for you. Um, but it, it covers uh, the teachers and the guidance counselors positions in the district. Um, the last five years, we've been trending upward. We had a, a significant um, increase over uh, in terms of our hiring. So it takes a, it's going to take a long time to close the gap to get to where we need to be. But I think incrementally, we're going in the right direction. Last year, we were just at about 60%, uh, just below 60% of our uh, hires, newly hired into the district, were um, identified as folks of color. So that was, that's a tremendous win for us in the trajectory and, and speaks to the programming and all the hard work that we as a collective are doing to uh, sort of diversify our workforce. Um, and next slide, how do I, oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, this slide here is a snapshot of all of, of our work, uh, of our entire workforce across the district. Um, of course, the first bar there to the left is the Garrity um, Educator, which is, again, that is just talking about teachers and guidance counselors. If you have, we could probably zoom out and get you all the numbers at some point, but what you're looking at today is just those um, two uh, categories of educators. And then we broke it out in the school budget. So you can kind of really get a snapshot of how diverse VPS is and the directions that we're going. This is our overall numbers. Um, you can see we're about um, the total district, about 66% identify as folks of color. So again, 
every year that we have higher in vacancies, we create goals that sort, sort of close the gap over time. It's not something we could do overnight, but uh, some of the initiatives that Rashawn will discuss are um, certainly helping us close the gap over time. Um, got it. So this slide, um, I think a lot of us feel it, we know it, um, but this kind of uh, puts it into perspective about uh, the number of vacancies that we have seen uh, based on exits. Again, this is just teachers and guidance counselors. We had a significant increase, unfortunately, this past year, but I think that, I think we, again, we all felt it anecdotally, the great resignation, right? Um, so last year we had about 493 vacancies of exits. This year we have, uh, we're anticipating for the 22-23 year, 846. Um, so that, and that's just, again, teachers and guidance counselors. So we do have uh, a, a lot of work to do um, there, but I just want to be transparent that not only um, are, you know, private employers feeling it, we are feeling it as well. Um, so again, the great work of the recruitment and cultivation team is going to help us sort of close this gap. Um, and the year over year retention has been pretty steady in the 90s. Um, we've been able to retain um, pretty much 100% of, of uh, folks uh, since 2021 into 2022, just a slight percentage drop there. Um, so I will, again, just some context, what you're looking at when you frame your questions. This is all a snapshot from 10-1 after we start our hiring season. So each trend is looking backwards in that way. Um, but again, we'll have some more uh, numbers for you as we sort of move through each hiring phase, if you will. So that's a snapshot of sort of where we are um, and what we're gonna continue to do in order to diversify, continue to diversify our workforce is a lot of the pipeline programming that's coming out of the Improvement Cultivation and Diversity Office. Um, we don't have a slide prepared for you, but if you have questions, I do have a partnership here that can speak to those things. I'll just um, close this off by saying that um, behind the scenes and outside the classroom, there are many um, unsung heroes that um, work day to day to make sure that BPS is um, working and um, operating um, efficiently. From the custodians every day to the uh, central office facilities team, to our transportation department, our drivers, the staff that are working day to day to ensure that um, kids get to school and kids are fed. I just want to publicly thank them as well for all the hard work that they do um, and their advocacy for some of the budget requests that you see here today before you. So we look forward to um, uh, answering some of your questions. Um, so I just wanted to add that tonight's budget presentation um, um, uh, is a reflection of that, FY23 rate of student funding, school by school in comparison. Um, we have the information around um, rate of student funding summarized for all schools. FY23 preliminary, preliminary general fund account code budget. And for more information, you can visit www.bostonpublicschools.org slash budget. All documents uh, will also be translated. Um, lastly, um, here you can see the dates of uh, upcoming budget hearings that we have available. April 24th, um, April 28th, April 28th, a couple of different times. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. So happy to answer your questions and we'll turn it over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, first, we have, we'll go straight to the counselors for questioning. Um, Counselor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation. So I'm going to use this first round for a few questions on um, the slides, the information you just shared. If um, you could answer why there's been a 70% increase in the need for bus monitors and Tied to that, I've been getting lots of calls of families, parents very concerned that their students are not getting picked up. And many of these are special ed students. Do we have data on how many students have missed school or arrived late to school or not able to get home from school properly? Like in what percentage is special ed and how many of those regular ed students? And um, another question, I know we have a shortage of staff across all departments, but if you could share which departments are really 
struggling the most? Is it food service and how many, it, you shared the teacher vacancy, but also like admin and other departments where we're really struggling seeing the loss this year, but also projecting for next year. One of the things that I'm probably going to end up for a little bit more detail as for Ms. Stanislaus to come down and give you some of the percentage, but there are, we are struggling with the driver shortage um, across the district, and that is, that is really hurting us um, tremendously. We had um, about 2% or so of our trips that are not covered on a daily basis because of this um, shortage. You said 2%? About 2%. And how many students, how many buses is 2%? So I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Stanislaus to come down and give yeah, you sure. the details. Thank you. Yes. That'd be helpful. Yes. Would you move to the chair? Yep, she can come okay. Thank you. Uh, we currently have 621 routed buses. Mm -hmm. um, we provide, uh, we currently provide services to um, 20,873 students in total daily. Um, and as of right now, um, also in terms of our driver stats, we currently have 856 drivers on staff. Um, However, we have 648 drivers that's um, available to drive daily. We have over 210 um, drivers that are currently out on leave. Um, so out of the 621 buses, 2% of those buses are um, uncovered daily. Um, and this year, our team has recruited the most drivers that we've ever recruited. We've recruited over 54 drivers. Um, year over year, uh, historically, we've only recruited, been able to recruit um, 15 drivers, which covers drivers um, who've retired. So of that 2%, though, because the family's listening in, like how many bus routes and how many students does that translate to? Yep, um, that fluctuate, it fluctuates daily um, today. Like uh, for example, like today we have 48 of our uh, trips that are uncovered. uncovered. Um, and on average, our buses have about 14.1 students um, on average. And what happens to those students? Yep, that's a good question. Um, when our buses are uncovered, um, families that call in that request backup buses, our team prioritize sending backup buses to families. Unfortunately, those buses run late because mm -hmm. we don't have a standby yeah. pool to cover. Yeah. So when families come in, we just send backup buses to cover. So how we communicate with families immediately once we know that there's yep. a shortage and how we communicate with the schools and yeah, I can add, I can add that as well. Yeah. So um, we've implemented um, a messenger system for our families where when our buses are uncovered, families, we send out a blast like text messages uh, after our AM bid in the morning that lets families know that our buses are, their bus is uncovered and we would work um, on figuring out like a backup bus um, to get students to school. Um, and we notify schools as well. We have a system where we also notify our schools uh, via email um, and our customer service rep would call schools to let them know when buses are uncovered. So if I did the math correctly, like today there were 676 students who did not get picked up to go to school. And how many of those were able to arrive? Uh, I don't have that information, but through our attendance, um, Portal. I'm pretty sure our IT our IT team would be able to yeah because um, that would be that good information. To, um, and also, is today a high day or a low day? Like we've seen worse, correct? Has it yes. been? Is are we trending towards going down? So that fluctuates, um, and we, what we've seen is um, after. Uh, break so after Christmas break, after February break, and after April break, we have seen um, like significant coverage issues. So it's a lot more than we've seen today. Do we know what the highest day was where students were 
stranded at bus stops? Um, I can definitely yeah. get that. I do, I do have the data. I don't have it pulled up okay. right now, but no, I, I am tracking that data. So I And I know there's a data. staffing shortage. It's not like anyone at bowling is not trying to get kids to school, but there's so many families that rely on this bus, which ties into the 70% increase of bus monitors, which means I'm assuming these are special ed students and it's written into their IEPs. So if you could talk to why, if somebody knows why we've increased so many. Um, I would just say briefly that um, that largely depends on the needs of families and working with their um, teams at the schools. As, as you're familiar with, um, as students are identified with uh, special education needs, team meetings are held and discussions are had on how best to support those students. So sometimes they require in, um, uh, a one-on-one -on -one monitor comes out of that conversation. So as those team meetings are held, we summarize. No, I understand the process, but I'm asking 70% is a huge increase. We, we can't dictate what the students' needs are, and we just have to accommodate that. So if those needs come out, we just accommodate and, and So I'm going to make an assumption, though, that our population has changed. Like, if I was just to look at numbers, and I mean, I was in the classroom up till last June, so I've been there. Like, wh why is there such a difference? And I, we can continue this in the next round, but that just seems like a huge increase, which doesn't help the bus crisis we're in. Yes. But thank you for thank coming on and answering those. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to stay if uh, we have further questions. No uh, problem. Appreciate you <laughs> hanging out with us. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at um, your, your, your beautiful locks and I'm <laughs> just completely blown away. Stay right there. Um, does this, is this, is this ring annoying? Should I change that? It's annoying me. It's fine. That's it's fine. Helpful. Okay. Um, <laughs> Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I'm just looking at the school assignment. Uh, there's four welcome centers. Um, wh where are the welcome centers located? And um, in for Alston Brighton, we're sort of out on this I call it an island, it's, um, <laughs> it's out there. Um, do, do welcome centers, do you have mobile welcome centers that go to, go to schools and uh, do on-site um, work with families? Uh, the other question I had was with regard to um, out-of-district transportation costs. We're just, you know, with 70% increase in our monitors, um, is there any analysis on uh, the number of students who actually have to travel out of district? Um, do the, um, those would, those, would prim those would be special needs students, um, but how many uh, students go out of district and what are the transportation costs? Uh, the other question I had was with regard to um, just uh, early access to pre-K. Um, I think one of the critical things to remember is that Boston BPS is in a competitive market for students and one of the best ways to attract and keep families is to have them get early access to pre-K um, and good support right from the very beginning. And then they're more likely to have some brand loyalty and stay with us if we do a good job. So um, I'm just wondering about um, early access to pre-K. And I just heard that there's um, you know, an additional 300 spaces uh, for, for uh, pre-K, but uh, that they weren't actually in BPS facilities that they were being sort of contracted out to other providers. So I'd like some more information on that. And um, and then I see you have a residency investigator, a full-time person doing residency investigations. Um, I'd be curious to know how many cases of residency investigations were carried out this past year and how many actual cases were identified of folks who said they were resident in Boston and who, who actually don't live here but were wanting to send their kids to Boston public schools. And I imagine they're wanting to them to send them to the exam schools. So uh, those are all my questions for now. Thank you. The assignment questions. Um, so the welcome centers are located in Roslindale, in Dorchester, in Roxbury, and the one in East Boston is part-time, which allows those staff members to do pop-up centers where needed. So, for example, the um, Alston Brighton is a good example of uh, our 
winding down the Jackson Man, where we provided in-person support to families to help them with their registration and assignment process. So they will move about. Um, you know, the same will be true if there's a closure at Mission Hill. They will then be there for um, three days a week. Um, <clears throat> the uh, so answer your questions in order here are, or let's see, early access to PK. Yes. I a thousand percent agree with you, <laughs> a thousand percent. And there's some tensions that happen. I can say that, you know, K0, which is for three-year-olds, is traditionally designed to be a program to support students um, with individual education plans and special needs. Um, the general ed seats are roughly 200, um, so it's not a lot because they are prepared for inclusion opportunities or um, additional opportunities, as I said, for, for students on IEPs. Um, having said that, there are more like 2,500 K-1 opportunities in the district. Um, unfortunately, our enrollment numbers for K-1 are down. For K-0, they're up. For K-1, they're down. Um, and we need to do a better job of how do we attract families back to BPS because I 100% agree. Again, if they come early, they tend to stay with us. On the flip side, <clears throat> we do open um, and partner with community-based um, organizations who also offer K-1 opportunities. And so there is a push and pull in making sure that our community partners are also vibrant and sustainable and um, working with them to hopefully collaborate in a pipeline that takes them from their programming to our programming starting at K2 or first grade. So um, it's attention and you know I wish that we had all the room in the world for every K0 and every K1 because I'm selfish and I agree that if we have them early we'll keep them but we also are mindful of those community partnerships and the space that we have um, in our buildings. Uh, residency investigator. I will have to um, tag someone in and find out for you. I can say that we look at hundreds of cases. The investigator literally drives out to many communities late at night, is there early in the morning, <laughs> looking and following to see where people truly live. Um, there are neighborhoods that um, do this more often than others and exam schools are certainly a problem but they're not the only ones there are certainly probably a, a half dozen to a dozen of very highly preferred schools no matter um, what grade there are and uh, and some neighborhoods um, outside of Boston where there are patterns of behavior and we've learned that so we now look for it There are 115 findings of residency, residency fraud so far this year, 225 completed investigations. Um, so that gives you a sense of the, the number that the team is dealing with. Um, and then the last thing, just to clarify on the uh, universal preschool, part of our strategy for universal preschool is partnering with community-based organizations to both strengthen a lot of the, the small community organizations serving um, uh, specific neighborhoods and as part of our um, overall strategy. So those are, in a lot of cases, city-funded classrooms um, in those uh, community-based organizations. Um, and your last question, I believe, was on out-of-district transportation. We provide out-of-district transportation for a couple categories of students, including out-of-district special education students, um, those students who are in foster care, and homeless students who are placed outside of the city. They are all three categories, fairly expensive on a per pupil basis, but um, I, I really think this is an area where we need to provide critical supports for families and stabilizing families in their school communities. And so I think it's a really um, important uh, service that we provide. And the McKinney-Vento is what the, the law that came into play around foster care and homeless youth, and I think that was a really important and good change for us as a community and, and as a state um, to be able to provide that transportation. I think the number of students in out-of-district um, special education from the hearing last week, if I remember remembering correctly, was 280, so I can, we can get the exact number. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have for now. Thank you. I've run out of time anyway. <laughs> uh, Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, Dr. Stanislaw, I wanted to start just by focusing on transportation. Um, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit more. I think the last few budget cycles, we've been talking about these one-year extensions to the um, transportation RFP, and now I see that again, you know, we're planning on putting something out fall and summer, but it wouldn't be till FY24, so that's next year. So I assume that we're, are we under or are we taking a one year extension again on the current contract? So can you talk a bit more about how we're planning to redesign the contract, sort of in that RFP invitation for bids, et cetera? Because I, I mean, I think the council again and again, right, has been frustrated by the design of the existing contract and particularly as transportation costs for the district have spiraled out of control in the sense that we don't necessarily control the right levers to drive a sort of different kind of performance um, or to split it up or all kinds. So I'm just sort of curious if you could walk the council a bit more through um, what you guys are planning to change in that invitation for bids process. Yep, um, thanks councilor. Um, so I just wanna start off by saying that um, the current RFP that's in place, the transportation um, team has implemented um, monthly performance reviews where we have made like significant improvement throughout the transportation um, operations. Uh, on the RFP piece, um, our team had started working after the last council hearing, um, the ways and means hearing that we had with the council to put out an invitation for bid. However, there were several transitions um, with uh, the mayoral team um, and we gave the new mayor that came in a chance to uh, go over the process that we were using. So we, we gave the mayor the options that we had on the table, whether we go out to bid right away, where, whether we um, extended the one year extension to TransDev, um, the mayor opted to extend the one year extension to TransDev and um, kind of like gave her a chance to go over the options um, for the current RF IFB that we're putting out. Um, to comment on what are some changes that we're putting in the, the IFB. So currently we, we, ha we currently have an, IF uh, sorry, an RFP, we're putting out an IFB. Um, and some of the changes in the, the current, the new contract that we're setting out are the financial, uh, the financial um, incentive piece. Um, currently, the financial incentive structure um, in the current RFP, uh, it, it's if the current contractor hits 95% on time performance um, daily, they, it's a million dollar incentive for the contractor. The contractor has never hit the, uh, consistently hit the 95%, so they've never got the, the, one, mil, the one million dollars. Um, they have a set three million dollar, a set three million dollar fee that they get every year. So um, what we're doing is like changing the financial structure where they get the contractor, um, if they don't hit if they don't hit um, the current like KPIs that we're setting out in the contract, they'll be fined for not hitting those KPIs. So it's, the contract is currently being structured a little bit different than the contract that's structured now. That and if I could just add, Councilor Bach, uh, good, good afternoon again. Um, we just also have to be very careful in how much we do say about what's in the actual um, RFP changes. Um, we could probably speak to it at a high level only just because we're, um, need to balance 30B purchasing requirements. We have to make sure we don't uh, divulge too much, but we can say at a high level, in, in essence, uh, what we can do. But uh, that's why she's probably not being real specific, and I know you sense, I'm sensing you're, you're feeling that as well. But I just want to name that we have to be careful how much we do say because of that, as well as because we're in contract negotiations um, as well um, with the bus drivers union. So we have to be careful how much we do say publicly about that. Th thanks, Sam, I appreciate that. Although I imagine it's technically TransDev that's in in negotiation Sorry, with when the I bus say driver. We, when I say we, the yeah. collectively, the BPS serves as an advisory capacity to those uh, right. contract negotiations. Yeah, so I guess the thing I would just stress is that, like, you know, the council has again and again, in the time I've been here and in the time before I was here when I was a staffer, has again and again, you know, just been really distressed by sort of our transportation costs spiraling and then as Councillor Murphy alluded to, sort of 
performance challenges, right? And it's, it's very frustrating to have something that you are both paying for excessively and doesn't like meet the public's expectations for performance, right? One wishes to at least have one or the other. Like it should either be a budget, like a, a well-controlled budget item or doing a really excellent job. And I, and I appreciate, you know, we've, I've heard enough from Director Stanislav over a number of hearings to know that the team behind the scenes is doing a tremendous amount of work to try to innovate and control in this space and set things up and also that it's been getting more and more complex with um, the, uh, particularly some of the um, IEP like constraints and such. So I'm very sympathetic to all of that, but just again and again, the idea that what we need is to rewrite the contract has been sort of like the solution. So I think the council has to be quite antsy that in this process that you guys are putting the IFB out and resetting the contract that it's like really gonna be that promised reform to this system, right? There's like a lot that's hanging on that. 10% of the school budget is hanging right. on that. Yeah. If, if I can just maybe point you in a, in a good direction, um, Director Stanislaus mentioned the monthly performance reviews that we've implemented. Yeah. And in those monthly performance reviews, you can see some of the data that we have and what we're holding the drivers accountable to as well as the company. I think that can give you a sense of where we're headed with the um, with the uh, with some of the improvements that we're, that we're looking for. Yeah, so I think that'd be helpful to have. And then I would just say on the bus monitors front, have we thought about whether we need to just fundamentally sort of shift that system? Because I think to Councilor Murphy's point, you know, a seventy percent increase in bus monitors is huge. I think what we've experienced in our office with family follow up is that. Um, you know, because the bus monitors are paid per diem and frankly not paid very competitively compared and we're in a tight labor market, there's a lot of times, right, where that's part of why, like, there isn't a bus monitor showing up. Um, and it just seems like the current, this current combination of individual IEP decisions that are being made and the per diem that we're paying, like, it's all just not working. So it feels like, I mean, it makes me wonder, not as very much not an expert, right, but like, you know, do we need to move as a system to some kind of pooled bus monitor like approach where we're like putting, you know, where maybe it's not like we're putting a couple of bus monitors on every bus or like, I, I don't know, something where there's like a more consistent expectation of employment and then we're also um, funding those positions at a rate where we can rely on them showing up because it just seems like we saw this radical shift in what we're being asked to provide on the IEP side and our system hasn't kind of like changed to meet it. So I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit. Yep, I can definitely speak to that. So our team um, launched a, a large um, organization, like a reorg within the unit. So right now we're currently working through the first phase of, of the reorganization and um, how we provide services to students um, that require bus monitors. And um, in parallel, where we are in um, contract negotiations with our bus monitors. So um, starting at the beginning of next school year, we should see um, some changes and some shifts in um, the support that students uh, receive and also um, on working through the contract negotiation pieces on how we kind of like structure um, monitors day to day work. If I could say that briefly, Councilor Bott, I um, just want to note that this is the final extension that we're entering into with, um, with, with this um, approach. And we did engage an external vendor to do a comprehensive busing market analysis for us to help inform the RFP as well. So we've done uh, taken those steps. And, and, and I just want to acknowledge the TransDev company and the bus drivers who've worked with us um, really closely over this last um, couple of years to make a lot of these improvements. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council Mejia, you have the floor. So I guess I think in the spirit of the way the chair started, I also want to just acknowledge that I know sometimes I show up with a little bit of a, a feisty attitude. Um, and so if I have offended or made anyone feel uncomfortable um, the way that I show up, I also take responsibility for that. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that if any way I have um, made you feel uncomfortable with my presentation, then um, I will also work on how I show up in this space. So just wanted to acknowledge, and I also, I know I'm using my seven minutes to do all of this, but whatever. But I also just want to affirm that it is not easy to be a woman of color here in the city of Boston, period. But then to be a woman of color who um, represents so many people who have been disregarded and disrespected for so long, that I always come into this chamber with an understanding of the responsibility that I have to bring all of who I am into these spaces and those voices. 
So not to make an excuse for it, but so that you understand the context in which um, the way I operate, okay? I have questions for everybody, counselor, uh, uh, chair. So I just wanted to know. Your time oh, starts now. Well, how many, no, but I, how many, we're gonna have three rounds? Cause I have a lot. Three, okay, good. So um, I'm going to just, I'm gonna start off with some of the things around the welcoming center. Um, I just, I'm curious, um, there was an incident, um, Sam, that you and I worked on alongside with my director of constituent services um, in a particular very specific incident at the Murphy School where two little girls were pulled out of the school for four weeks um, because there was this investigation launched. Um, and so we, we were able to do a little bit of research and we ended up getting the girls back into school and we realized it was one big mix up. But that mix up cost them four weeks of their school and it also compromised um, their placement, I believe, and also, or I'm sure you guys fixed that too. There were some issues in terms of whether or not they were gonna be able to go into an exam school. So while I really do appreciate the number of investigations that we have, what I've been hearing from some folks is that oftentimes families of color in particular feel like they're being targeted. And there is this element there that I just wanna name for the record um, that we need to really figure out I'm not saying that this is what is happening, but this is how families are experienced, these full-on investigations. And I think that um, the ombudsman, is that how you pronounce it? I, I think that when we start thinking about um, how we support families, that we need to make sure that we're doing so in ways that families feel like uh, BPS is with them, not working against them. So I just wanna name that as, as an issue that has surfaced up. Thank you, Councilor, um, here for raising that. And, and I think uh, working with your office and using that example as a case study, we can look at how we look at our procedures internally and how we make sure that we tighten those procedures up so that doesn't happen again. Thank you for that. And um, Denise, you were affirming that the little girls are going to be able to. Yes, they were able to look, they could receive whether or not they were in MC, they were put back into the queue before the queue was run. Okay, great. Thank you. So justice has been served and we've done our job, so I'm happy to hear that um, situation turned out that way. Um, but there is some infrastructure work, right, and some uh, support that we can do there in terms of professional development that I think you all should you know, consider as you think about your budget. Um, then I, I wanted to, following the, the welcoming center, I'll stay here for a little bit, and then I'm gonna go to Mr. Martin at some point. I'm gonna ask you to come into the, uh, so just wanna make your way down because the next questions are gonna be around staffing. So I don't wanna use my seven minutes and you walking down a catwalk. Um, Denise, if you could talk to me a little bit about kind of like the infrastructure that is put in place for um, families who are experiencing schools that are closing or have had to, through some traumatic experience, have needed to start that process. You know, we've been hearing from a lot of families that, you know, in terms of placing first priority, um, that I think when we think about these issues, restorative justice, right? And how do we repair the harm? The first way that we could do that is by honoring families and what their needs are. So can you talk to us a little bit about some of the infrastructure and some of the things that we can learn um, based on the examples that we've experienced this last year in terms of what the Welcoming Center is gonna be doing differently to support families like this? Certainly, thank you for that question. Um, we are really uh, spending a lot of time really thinking and putting our feet um, in the shoes of families who would experience this. Many of us are, are parents, um, and as I said, you saw the diversity of the team who's working on this. Um, the goal is one-to-one -one meetings. If we don't see them registering for them, we're going to call them and try and schedule them with them. People can do the process without us. We'd rather they do it with us. When they do it with us, we get to have conversations about what is it that they're trying, what needs are they trying to meet? Because sometimes there's a school in their mind, and, right. and sometimes their needs mean that this could be this school or this school or this school. Um, we are working with them to identify and understand the sibling age ranges, which we have, but more importantly, do they want them all together, which narrows if they've got kids from K-0 to seventh grade versus if they have maybe just a couple of littles, you know, so trying to understand their desires there. We're looking at things like, you know, say they don't have siblings and they're little. 
Right. They want someone to go with. Right. We're looking at how we can partner with a buddy priority. Mm -hmm. We're offering that. Um, we are being flexible about a school that might be outside of their home-based list. That is new to us. All right. So I just want to go on the record that I am in full support of uh, uh, some of the schools that are advocating for first priority and whatever it takes for us to make that happen. I just want to go on the record yeah. and say that I'm here for that. But I, I do want to get to some of my um, diversity questions so we can, I could, um, the second round, okay? Um, so Mr. Martin, I'm just curious if you could talk to us a little bit about how the district is supporting some of our principals of color, um, implement um, some of the anti-racist work in their schools and some of the backlash that we've been getting um, in regards to the tension that exists between the districts and the community and staff. Like, how is BPS handling these situations in order to support these um, principals? And uh, also, um, can you just dive in a little bit deeper into the data and regarding the new hires? Like, I'm interested in knowing how many black and teachers, Asian, white, Latinx, male, and um, you, we do have a lot of great pro pipeline programs, but I'm just curious about what does the return on the investment look like? How many folks are we are able to secure through some of these um, pipeline programs? And then I think that's gonna take up the rest of my seven minutes. Okay, sure. Um, I'm Rashawn Martin. I'm the acting director of uh, recruitment in our Office of Cultivation and Diversity Programs. Um, and for the record, normally uh, our uh, managing director, Dr. Saren Daly, uh, who's in charge of the office, um, uh, would be here, but she's, uh, she has traveled to South Carolina uh, to pick up her, her daughter from college and, uh, and to help her get home. Um, so in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the school leaders, um, we do have um, a school leaders of color network, which, uh, which is managed out of our office, so it's, um, it's an affinity group space that is um, afforded to all of our school leaders of color uh, to, um, to help them both uh, collaborate and receive assistance from us um, you know, for whatever needs that they have in terms of working um, with the community. Um, and I know that there have been, um, uh, there have been you know, trainings and assistance um, available uh, to them um, provided by our um, division of, of equity and, and strategy um, and, uh, and opportunity gaps. You know, so, um, uh, so that's the program that our specific uh, office um, provides. And what's been also nice is that we've, we've also have created a, a robust um, you know, uh, affinity group you know, program um, for, uh, for many groups of our educators of color, um, whether it be across the district or by department. Um, for our for my colleagues to have these spaces uh, to be able to come uh, to co to collaborate and have conversations about um, about race and anti-racism, we even have one in the central office that actually meets. Um, uh, it started on a weekly basis um, after the death of George Floyd, but they actually meet um, bi-weekly now. Um, and a great opportunity also where we've afforded uh, the, the superintendent an opportunity to be able to meet. Um, with all of these groups of educators of color um, periodically throughout the course of the school year to understand the issues um, uh, that they face. Um, in, terms of the, uh, um, in terms of the hiring, um, I'm sure that uh, you know, my, my data colleague, in terms of the data breakdown, I actually haven't looked specifically yet in terms of the number of, um, of, of, of black, you know, Asian, you know, the Latinx educators that we've ha hired so far. I am, you know, I am thrilled that more, that close to 60% of the educators that we have submitted currently um, for hire out of the, you know, meaning out of the 285 have identified um, as an educator of color. And we're still relatively early, you know, or kind of middle, let's say, of the hiring season. You know, we, we started formally back on, back on the 1st of, uh, of March. and. Um, you know, and in a large system like ours, you know, we are, um, you know, we, we are hiring, you know, consistently, you know, throughout the, the spring as we head to the summer, and then also, um, you know, all the way up until the, um, until the first day, until the first day of school. So when we think about last year, um, in terms, especially in terms of our um, external hires, because transfers do get counted, um, you know, for for hires, which is great, you know, for um, in terms of retention. But um, we had um, 
you know, we had a 59% rate of, uh, um, of, of educators of color hired externally, meaning new to district. Okay. And so I'm glad that we're on, you know, um, that we're on track. And certainly, you know, our goal is to have that, you know, is to have that number increase once we ultimately have the official final count come October, you know, come October 1st. And then was your last question about pipelines? No, I think I'm already at my oh, time, yeah, time, so we okay. can just go back around and then just sure. know that that will come. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilman here. Councilor Worrell, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. Um, my question is around safety. Um, Want to make sure that we're ensuring a safe environment for our students to learn. Uh, can you go into a little bit more in depth about your safety plan? Um, also, it's come to my attention that BPS and BPT, BPD has started um, meeting. Uh, can you tell me when those meetings have started, what's being shared, and how often um, those, those meetings will be happening? And then also, do all of our schools have cameras? Um, and if not, which ones do? And how often are we doing an internal audit to check on those cameras at those schools? Good question. I'll start a little bit and I'll let um, Deputy Chief Johnson um, um, speak a little bit more to some of the day-to-day -day operations. I think um, as far as communication with Boston Police, um, they happen on multiple levels is how I'll describe it. The first is that day-to-day -day, there's constant interaction between the Boston Police School Unit as well as our safety service officers on a lot of day-to-day -day matters live and on the ground. And um, uh, Deputy um, uh, Chief uh, Johnson will speak to that in a second. And then there's also conversations between BPD leadership as well as um, BPS leadership on um, how we work and operate. So we spent the better part of last year engaging in initial conversations um, in preparation for the police bill reform to be enacted. Um, so we talked through how that would work, what that would look like. Initially there were some disagreements between our two departments on how that would work and operate, but naturally having discussions and putting our um, uh, opinions on the table, we've worked through most of those issues. Um, I would describe it as there hasn't been um, full implementation and education between everybody involved and in how to implement what we've discussed. So on the BPS side anyways, I can only speak to BPS side. We've um, drafted some documentation and communication that we're working with our school leaders and our staff on training how that interaction should look and ought to look. And I'm assuming you know, BPD is doing similar on their end, um, but you, you'd have to speak to them on that part. Um, so that's how I would describe our um, relation with BPD. And I, I don't know, Deputy Johnson, you wanna add to that? The day-to-day -day operations, um, I meet daily with Sergeant Sexton, who's in charge of the um, school unit with the Boston Police. We discuss, um, you know, where their support is needed. Um, the relationship has changed with um, transition with our department and with the police reform bill, but um, we're working through it and we are in touch with the um, DPS legal department with any questions and we go through them um, almost daily with um, things we can share with BPD um, and other agencies and they put in requests for it and if it is approved, uh, we work with them on certain situations like that. And I would also add that um, Jillian Kelton, our Assistant Director of Safety Services, who's um, here with us as well, she also engages in um, various conversations and meetings where BPD is present along with um, Rufus Falk's Office of Public Safety as well. There's um, regular meetings there that she can speak more specifically to, but there are various meetings that we attend with them, both internally as city departments and partner organizations, but also in the community. Um, uh, Deputy Chief Johnson is attending various community meetings on safety as well. Yes, I attend um, Baker House meetings and the um, Project Right meetings in Grove Hall. Um, the Baker House meetings are weekly and the other one is uh, monthly. And our, uh, the bids you had mentioned about uh, obstacles and stuff like that. Our big, biggest obstacle is um, because of the transition, we're um, operating at a severe shortage of uh, people in our department, and it's been a struggle to fill those positions, but um, the schools are requesting support from us, and we're doing the best we can filling them. And how short are you, how short? Um, probably like two years ago, we had 77 to our department. We have probably in mid 40s now. And, and about cameras. We sure. So, um, I'm going to ask that Executive Director Brian Ford come down to talk to you about the plans that we've had as far as how many cameras we have and what we're doing moving forward as well. 
And while he's on his way down, I just note um, uh, in Monday's hearing, I alluded to a safety survey audit that we did um, a few months ago with our school leaders. And he'll speak to kind of where we are now with that work as it relates to the camera. Awesome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. My name is Brian Ford. I'm the executive director of the facilities management team for BPS. Um, in regards to our security camera plan, we are currently working on installing cameras across the district. Uh, with that being said, we have made changes based on recent incidences at Madison, Tech Boston, Tinskall, over 200 cameras and continue installing cameras on a, on a daily basis to make sure we're out there with about 220 cameras installed at Tech Boston over April break, uh, ongoing plans at Madison to install additional cameras as well. Um, with that, we are also working on cabling to make sure that there's supportive infrastructure across all of the schools to support new camera heads and servers and recording devices going forward. I've had the pleasure of meeting with Deputy Johnson uh, and many others to make sure that we get the communications out to schools. Um, currently, the memo is drafted to go out hopefully within the week um, to let the schools know exactly how we plan to address this. We also have a system in place for our asset essentials. That's our work order system. That is gonna take feedback from community leaders, not community leaders, I'm sorry, school leaders that will allow us to take into opinion where they think they best, best, uh, sorry, most need um, cameras inside of their schools and we send a security person out to do that drafting and make sure they talk with them. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the perimeter of the schools are also have uh, lighting upgrades that's continuing to happen. Um, exterior improvements to the parking lots and making sure that we've got clarity and security cameras overall as we go moving forward. And is there an internal audit like to see if the cameras are working, if they're pointing in the right direction and how often is that happening? Yes, so we have a person on staff, Nick Sacramona, who's in charge of our system mm -hmm. and uh, he works closely with school leaders so as they're, uh, if they realize the camera's down in a particular area, He's deployed immediately out to have discussions and we work on um, correcting the problem. But it's not done on like once a month, twice a year. He, it's just as, as a student, I mean, as the school leaders yeah, requested. If I could add quickly on that subject. So when a camera goes down, uh, we're immediately notified to how it goes down. If the camera is mispositioned, it's something that would only happen from monitoring it. And I know that um, Deputy Johnson touched up on this, but we've got a shortage in safety officers that are able to actually review the footage along with um, Nick from our team and other people as well. They're not monitoring constantly, mainly uh, used uh, after the fact. But as soon as we recognize that there's an issue, teacher recognizes an issue, safety re recognizes an issue, we make sure to get that out there. And that's also part of our asset essentials work order system that makes sure we respond to these immediately the safety and emergency issues. I mean, I would like to just have like a clear, you know, internal audit being done maybe twice a year, once a year, um, instead of putting it on our students, I mean, our teachers. Um, and my last question before my time runs out, um, our school nurses, uh, can you share with me on the protocol when a school nurse or a school should call 911 if a child is going through a health, health, health crisis? And if there's any information that our school nurses have on that student's medical record, like their medical records, if any. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on that, um, just because I don't want to misspeak about the actual kind of policy and how we go about that. Um, so if, if I can, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. But typically they would work with the student and work with the families during communication during an emergency. And, and collectively they make those calls with the parents um, most of the time. But I can get back to you with more specifics. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor President Flynn, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and apologize for being late this morning. Um, thank you to the BPS panel that's here. So I just want to follow up on Councilor Worrell's questioning. Um, as it relates to cameras, is there a, do we have an inventory of where the cameras are throughout BPS? Yes. My name is Brian Ford, Executive Director of BPS Facilities. Uh, yes, we do have uh, all camera locations on file. And what is the procedure if someone wants to review um, 
the video of the camera? What is the procedure? I'm not saying the public, I'm just saying if some city official wants to review a situation, how was that process determined? Um, so in that process, we actually have this uh, fairly long document based upon the need of the video itself uh, as it pertains to the student safety of um, monitoring minors and buildings and making sure everything around that is, is processed correctly uh, in uh, accordance, I'm sorry. Now if I could just add to that, Council Flynn, I, I would defer to our legal office for an opinion on that before I respond. You know, okay, I'm just kind of curious when, when someone does request it, say a city official, would, what, what, we, what, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, if, if a city official, just generally speaking, if the city official requests that, what, how do, what happens? If, if it's a city department, um, with, so such as Boston Police Department, and we need to review footage for any crimes that may have been committed, we work closely with them and have those procedures flushed out. But above and beyond that, I'd like to consult with our legal office before I comment on it. Okay. Um, on the, as it relates to public safety in, in the schools or on the school grounds, what is the biggest challenge that you face? We are understaffed, and so we are kind of uh, pulled in multiple directions, and um, we are in the process of hiring, so if you know anyone, that if the application is on the website, um, but that's one of the bigger challenges, and, um, as you had some of that touched on before about mental health, um, kids have crisis situations, that's kind of a challenge too. Mm -hmm. um, we work closely with the like nurses and administrative staff with dealing with that. And the last um, resort is to um, call an ambulance or the best team for hospitalization and support with them. So the so the personnel challenge is really not a challenge about funding. It's just hiring hiring people, basically, right? Yes. Um, are you? Are you recruiting people um, a certain way that you're reaching the entire city? Are you reaching? Um, are you reaching the Asian community? Are you reaching the Latinx community? Are you re are you going through some of these local newspapers that might be targeted or geared towards a particular um, ethnic group that that they might read the advertisement? I have reached out to the Asian community. I have spoken with. Um couple of partners and a school leader um, from the Quincy School, and he was going to reach out to the um, his connections in the Asian community and give them the information. I've also um, spoken and given the information to um, Project Right Mike Kozu in the Grove Hall area. He also would said he would reach out to the Asian community and Cape Verdean community to try to um, recruit some of those um, people and I'm working on other avenues to recruit where I'm in high need of um, females. Could, yes. could we reach out maybe to, to like El Mundo or the Bay State Banner? sort of the reach out for other uh, positions as well. I want to add that, you know, we just went through this police reform bill. Um, so this position looks a lot different than it did two years ago, friends. So our strategy has to be a lot, a lot different, <laughs> um, to be quite honest with you. Um, and we have to look at, you know, this was a, at one point a gateway for BPD, but it's not, right? Because of some of the items that have come into the reform bill. So it's a much different position for recruiting for something that's completely different than we were in the past. So our strategy has to be a little bit different, that has to be refined. Um, and we just haven't been able to find those folks yet, just because of the change. Okay. Um, and then,
Council Rell mentioned reporting the reporting requirements. What is what is the reporting requirements for any BPS official if if they notice something that should not be taken? What is that process? What is like the standard operating procedure for BPS and how you notify appropriate authorities? It, it would obviously depend on the incident and the type of incident, uh, and that would direct uh, which reporting agency you report to. So we do have some policies that I can share with you. Um, more specifically, we have our child and, abuse, uh, child and abuse and neglect circulars that we have. We have other circulars such as those that maps out clearly like um, who to call for what specific incidents. Do you, you have that written out as part of policy? We have different policies that allude to that, yes. Yeah, I'd like to take a look at them. Sure, and, and, and uh, we can get those to you, and they're all online um, on our website. If you go to the BPS website and look up Superintendent Circulars, they're all listed there, and I can send you some specific ones if that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. For clarification, um, were you saying that the process of reporting out um, crisis or incidences of to uh, on the website, or just the different services? Uh, the different circulars and procedural circles and how uh, BPS staff should report up incidences, and we also have um, reporting frameworks and memos that I can share how that communication happens. Um, so I have a couple of uh, one example here, if, if you want to see an example, but. For example, we have a day-to-day -day memo and guidelines that we provide to schools that we train on like what to do in different situations, who to call for what. Um, I can provide others if that's helpful. Okay. Um, that, that would be helpful because we're talking, I mean, so previous, uh, in the previous hearing, we talked about the different um, multi-tier, what do you guys call it? Tier systems. Was MTSS? Yes. So, um, Multi-tier, what's the acronym stand for again? Multi-tiered systems of support. Systems of support. And then that, those tiers are basically, well that, that program is basically supposed to be implemented to see the, or to address the, the whole child. And that meant then that it had to be holistic. And in order for it to do that, you have to do it in a harm reduction type of trauma-informed, with wraparound services. And that as things escalated, it went from tier one, tier two, tier three. Then you have this service, safety service or safety component in terms of how you do that, right? So all of this um, MTSS informs your safety reporting or addressing crisis. That's correct. So um, what we train our schools is to follow the MTSS model and also um, use progressive discipline um, and using our code of conduct to address a lot of these matters. And what we've done uh, with this round of code of conduct is we've separated um, the safety service officer's role in any code of conduct matters related um, to student discipline at schools and left the decisions on how to pursue with minor infractions to school leaders with the more egregious um, incidents and criminal offenses. Those, do, those we work with Boston Police directly on and we have procedures spelled out for that. So to your point, some of the memos that you'll see will be grounded in tier one, will be more appropriate for that. Some will be grounded in tier two, and some to tier three. So there's different varying levels of those as well. I mean, just from like first look of it, um, like BPD at some point gets involved, obviously when things escalate. Um, and I just want to be like very, we, we want to be very mindful in terms of like harm reduction, what that means. and where we're headed with that. And then my question um, was for the cameras. If we do have an audit, then do we have a list of the locations that are missing with cameras? So just speaking of the moment. Uh, Brian Ford, BPS Facilities Executive <laughs> Director. Um, yes, we are able to identify exactly where we are missing cameras, schools that are missing them. Okay. And, and as he alluded earlier, he works with the school leaders and our teams to identify places where they would like to strategically place them if, if, that, if that's a need. So Are students involved in that process? Um, I'm not sure, um, uh, but we definitely get back to you on that. Okay. Um, in terms of school ad admission, is there ongoing investigation on the uh, residency fraud currently, or you just, as they come up? Can you repeat the question? 
In terms of uh, admission, mm -hmm. is there an ongoing investigation for residency fraud, or is it just as they get reported? It's a combination. Right? So as they get reported to us, maybe by someone from the school or another family, um, and we do some due diligence around places where we know typically fraud happens, and so we may do some proactive looking at those lists as well. Okay, thank you. Um, for transportation, what are your efforts? You mentioned you're increasing diversity. I noticed that um, the people that came with finance, the people that came with higher levels were majority Caucasian or white, but the, the people that come with food, transportation, and other things are more people of color today. So it's a very, it's like a stark difference between your uh, budget and finance and other administration roles to what we see. And I know you've spoken to that already. Um, and so it's, it's like, it's very obvious, like who came in the last hearings and who's here today. So we, I really want to understand what is the effort to increasing diversity in hiring and in your higher uh, management roles? So, I mean, just briefly on our end, um, one of the goals in the strategic plan for the superintendent was to um, have a workforce that reflects um, our students. And um, the strategic plan that was developed under Dr. Caselli has really um, stated that boldly. Um, and she has uh, used the budget to staff positions and to draft messages and policies around that. So we do our hiring um, and we have our um, recruitment fairs. We're always um, looking and pushing for diversity uh, at all different various cultures um, and, and genders. Are you, are you um, making efforts to recruit parents as well? Yes. Not just in food service, but in other areas, and how are we doing that? Yes, yeah, so I'll just cite one example out of many. Um, we recently had um, a career fair that we worked closely with um, the, the faith-based community, and um, Dr. Branson and his team, um, along with the OAC, worked collectively to have a fair and do outreach to the churches, and many of those churches and um, churchgoers are, are most of our parents as well, so that was just one example of many. Thank you. In terms of harm reduction, we know that it's additional efforts in terms of bringing in social workers or people that triage uh, crises for intervention. This means you need more money, but you decreased the funding by 101,000. Is that, can you explain how that makes sense? Why would, make, why would it make sense to decrease it for school safety services as opposed to increasing it? Because harm reduction takes more resources and money. But if we're doing harm reduction, why are we decreasing the money? Yeah, if you could cite specifically where you're looking at, my understanding is that the safety service office budget was level funded. Um, in, uh, uh, if you could speak specifically. I took so it I to from the budget in 2000 and so what's proposed from, what was in 2022, uh, 5,390,566. Mm -hmm. Then for 23 is 5,288,686, which gives you a deficit or decrease of 98, 0.98% of 101,000. Thanks. Uh, we had a one position change out of the safety services office. It was a change of um, one of the safety officer positions to increase social and emotional support that came outside of, of safety. So to, to your point about the effort to do more in restorative justice and, and um, to look at the whole child, part of our approach to this was to, to, um, to shift those resources. Um, there was initially a plan the superintendent wanted to move um, more safety officers, but given um, the sort of uh, direction we're going in, there's a hold now on the total number of officers as we, as we again, learn more about the, um, the implementation of this restorative justice efforts. Same for nutrition, it decreased. It's, why is that? Yeah, food nutrition services is funded primarily through a federal reimbursement, the federal meals program and there's funding um, that is supported through general funds outside of that. So the general fund support, we change annually based on our projected receipt of revenue. Um, over the last two years during the pandemic, our revenue from the federal government has gone down. Our efforts to serve families during multiple different 
avenues has been supported by city funding. Um, what we anticipate is increased revenue next year and therefore a decrease in the amount of general fund support we need. But um, our commitment is to make sure that all students who show up ready to eat are served and we adjust that throughout the year if our costs go higher. So there is no planned reduction in services. It is just an estimate of the federal reimbursement. Okay. Um, it's an estimate, so why decrease it then? I think any, any given year when we're trying to balance our budget, there's, there needs to be um, a balance of realistic expectations around external revenue and recognizing that if we kept that general fund dollar amount constant from year to year, that would mean that we had less to invest in other places. And so we made that trade off um, this year because we believe um, we'll be able to balance food and nutrition services. But we know that junk food costs cheap less than healthy foods. If we're doing, if we're going toward whole child and thinking about social emotional health and mental health, we need more nutritious foods, which is going to cost way more money. What are the plans for that? So, so as Mr. Lakuta Mr. alluded to, uh, the food service department is self-sustaining, basically, and we drive our revenue based on what we, what we um, serve. So we have a lot of menu guidelines and standards that we use that are healthy, and those menu guidelines and standards that are, are given to us, we um, do those procurements that way. Um, so we purchased the healthier food and options. Um, we made strides in those areas, and we um, uh, account for those increases in cost in the budget. So we're confident, as Mr. Kuda alluded to, that with the funds that we have available now as the, through the federal grant, we can buy those initial purchases, conduct the business of uh, serving the meals, working with the state to, to make the claims, and getting those dollars back. And if we need to make an adjustments, that's where the um, city uh, resources would come into play. Thank you for your breakdown of how you plan on sustaining the finance part of it, but what about the plans to make the food healthier? Sure. So I'm going to, I'm going to have, to, uh, I'm going to have Ms. Um, Deborah and Charlie come down and there's a number of things that we are uh, working on. Meanwhile, Meanwhile um, if it's okay with you, yes. as you come down, yes. I, let me get to the next question. Yes. Thank yes. you. Um, what about procurement? Our largest contracts go to Apple products, transportation, construction, and food. Do you have the demographics to your largest um, procurement vendors or your contractors? Um, so in the, in the original packet that we submitted as well as um, in some of the information reshared this week, we do have the largest contracts and whether or not they are certified women or minority owned businesses. Um, so I'm happy to sort of walk through that answer now if you'd like the details. Um, um, and then most of them are out of Boston, out of Massachusetts. What, are we making efforts to contracting food vendors in Boston or Massachusetts? I know that there's a, there's a lot of like businesses that we, uh, what efforts are we doing to try to um, sustain or financially sustain small businesses in Boston? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll use this as an opportunity to introduce um, Naveen Reddy, who's our business manager, works on the finance team. Um, and he can come down and talk a lot of the coordination and efforts that, that we're doing with um, the mayor's office to, to do equitable procurement. I think this is an area where we've um, had a lot of focus because you're exactly right. This city contracts are an opportunity for us to invest in our communities. Um, I will say the largest contracts are often secured through a public bidding process where we do not have the opportunity to um, uh, influence the sort of direction of it from a minority women business perspective. But again, I'll, um, maybe we can move to the food nutrition questions and then um, Naveen can come down and talk about some of our efforts. And briefly while he's coming. While I'm not going to add any more questions to that, but sorry um, if you give me a moment to respond to uh, Mr. Kuder. I'm not going to add any more questions after this, and I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councillor Lada um, here, and then we'll go to you next for your questions. But um, before the two questions can be answered, um, some of these, so we may not have influence in terms of like public influence in terms of who applies, but we do have an influence in terms of putting in uh, certain protocols that requires that we contract minority and women. and. Um, and I mean, 
it's, it's mo so most of the money, and for the public that's gonna be watching this at home, most of the money in BPS is going to contract to outside of Boston or Massachusetts to white owned businesses. And so if most of the money, if that's where the, if that's where the possibility of economic mobility and sustainability or, or mo mobility is, then we should, we should have protocols that requires them to go to minority and women. And I think, so that's, there's the influence, that if there isn't a protocol, some policy that says that we should contract to those groups, then we're a little far behind on that and we should implement those protocols. Same with across the board of all the departments. The protocol should be higher, okay, for example, what is the demographics of BPS? How many black kids in percentage? We should know that off the top of our head. For the whole BPS. but it goes by Latinx community, black community, white, Asian. What's that percentage? 43.1% identified as um, Latinx, 32.2% identified as black, 14.5% identified as white, 8.7% identified as Asian, and 1.6% identified as other multiracial. Sorry, what was the white one? 14.5%. So that means that all of BPS, all of your contracts, all of your services should be 43% Latinx, 33% black, 14% white. That is equity, right? That, that's, that's saying that the BPS, who we serve, is reflected by who is doing, is actually, right, implementing is the work. And so that we teach our kids to reflect the demographic serve, that we, that, we, that we are contracting out in the same way. And I think that when we, when we can't look at numbers like that, when we can't actually look at and say, oh, if it's 43% Latinx, then does that mean it's 43% people, Latinx people hired in BPS or contracted? And these contracts are clearly very, very lopsided, right? So that's, and I think the next conversation is, when we're talking about money, it's, yes, this is ways and means, but when we're talking about money and allocations and contracts, we have to look at who is the money and the contracts and the jobs going to as well. Because those same parents then have to take care of their kids. Because if you respect me, then you pay me to feed my children. And I think that that's where, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm surprised that you don't have a protocol that says that you have to contract out um, based on demographics. I'll, I'll let Mr. Levine go in a second, but I just quickly add that over the years we have um, put in place languages um, in our RFPs to reflect the um, demand and desire for BPS to look for um, black and um, women um, owned businesses, minority owned businesses. So I'll just let uh, Mr. Reddy speak more on that. Good morning, councilors. Uh, my name is Naveen Reddy. I am the business manager. Um, for the district and we oversee procurement and uh, accounts payable and a couple of other things. Um, over a year ago when I got hired, one of the first things um, Chief Fooders told me was, uh, surround your work with three things, equity, transparency, and partnership. And over the past year, what we have done is put protocols in place. We have trained all of the schools we have done three different trainings on equitable procurement and over 10 trainings on procurement in general. And as part of the equitable procurement trainings, any procurement over 10,000, we need to include at least one minority and women-owned business as part of the outreach. At this point, because of the Massachusetts general laws, we cannot award them just based on the certified status, but we have to award them based on they being responsive and responsible being the lowest bidder. So, but there are other projects we're working on, multitude of projects to make sure that we are putting equity in the center of procurement. 
Uh, we're working with the city on a sheltered market marketplace program where some of our contracts can only go to minority and women-owned businesses. We have rolled out a central office policy. Shelter marketplace the, program, the one that's been proposed in the ARPA funds? Correct. No, uh, I'm not sure if it's proposed in the ARPA funds. Okay. So this is in general for all contracts for the city. Thank you. Um, and we have also done smaller, which I think one of the things we have learned over time is it's not about the big contracts. It's also about the small things we buy from our neighbors in our building and surrounding us. So, for example, like catering, we've implemented a policy for the bowling building. You only want to buy food within a half mile radius just for the bowling central office uh, catering so you can buy it from your neighbors and, and your community who's just around us. We're looking at other programs where we can just look at how we can support, extend our written code contracts. Again, this is a legislative process we are working with, with the city on, on trying to increase our written code process from 50,000 to 250,000 for just minority and owned business contracts. This is again a legislative process. Uh, I'm sure you, uh, you have all heard about it, but we are also in partnership with ANF and the Supplier Diversity Office. We have had a multitude of meetings on trying to take it to, to the legislation and get that passed. I think all of these efforts on training, changing the mindset, including um, any procurement over 10,000 having outreach for minority and um, owned businesses and all of these other surrounding aspects will move the needle slowly, but we're hoping we'll get there sooner. Thank you, Naveen. My name is Deborah Ventricelli. I'm currently the um, acting executive director of Food and Nutrition. Could you repeat your question, please? Oh, I think uh, Naveen answered the one about protocols for okay. procurement. You were, you were, you had asked about the, the food, quality, quality of the food. Standards, quality uh, food. The one, okay, the one for nutrition. Yeah. Um, so, what are the efforts to making our foods healthier and hopefully doing them um, by contracting small business in Boston? Mm -hmm. So um, regarding the menus and what we're currently serving, we're constantly revising the menus, um, getting feedback from the students, and based on that, making changes, and making sure that they're seasonal. Um, we, have, um, a, you know, we have a big produce company that we deal with, um, and we have a fresh fruit and vegetable company um, program that um, is in, I think, 75 schools that introduces the children um, to different types of fruits and vegetables. Uh, we're bringing back salad bars. Um, some schools, that doesn't work very well, so we're doing like grab-and-go salads. Uh, we applied for a grant with the Dairy Council for um, smoothies. We're going to start doing that, um, starting at the high school level and then, and then bringing, bringing it down from there. We've, um, we have our own nutrition um, standards other than those from the state, which are stricter, which prevents us from using any kind of additional um, additives um, and increasing fresh products um, even more than we're required to. Um, we, the training um, has increased. We've kind of revamped our department. So we now have a training manager and that person um, is increasing um, the food safety training for our staff and food handling. Um, we have three and also we meet, um, we, each month we, we meet with our school man managers, review all the updates, get feedback on the food, um, discuss new products that we're thinking of, we're thinking of bringing in. Um, we hired a um, operations director to oversee our field staff. We have seven field coordinators uh, that monitor what's going on in the schools. And um, we have three um, culinary managers on staff. They do recipe development, um, they do product testing, and they do training with our staff. Um, the menus, just cooking in general, knife skills, things like that. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. um, may, are you communicating this on the websites? Mm. So there. So hopefully we'll get to a point where you yeah. there's a metric and you know we've converted or changed three schools. We have 122 to go. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Thank you. 
Council Lowry, you have the floor. I'm going to give you a full time um, to, to go through the, your questions. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to the administration of Boston Public Schools for being with us here today. Uh, please excuse my tardiness and uh, forgive me if any of the questions that I asked have already been answered. Uh, and let me know if they've already been answered. I, I can watch the video. You don't need to repeat yourself. Um, so part of this hearing is around human capital. Is that around like teacher hiring as well? Is that what you would consider like this is where the correct place to ask those questions? Yes. yes. Um, bear with me. I just came into this hearing after having my son's IEP hearing <laughs> and um, have just been told that I'm going to have to find a new school for him because they're moving to full inclusion. And when the IEP team let me know what um, the setup was going to be for full inclusion, I found that it was laughable that they would have one general education teacher and one paraprofessional in a classroom of 24 students or four students, um, were students that have IEPs. Obviously that doesn't work with my son, but the question, and, and we'll figure it out, but my question is around your staffing and you know, that's obviously not an adequate amount of staffing for that classroom. Um, how is increasing um, staffing in classrooms, full inclusion classrooms, but also, you know, I find that the special education classrooms um, are typically adequate. You probably have like a one to three, one teacher to three student ratio in the sub separate classrooms, but in the full inclusion classrooms, is there a metric that you use to decide how many teachers are there? Is it because you don't have enough? Like where? How do you make those decisions and where can we figure that out? Um, I think that's a really important question and um, I, I apologize, our head of special education is not um, here with us today, but I can say a lot of our um, staffing ratios are dictated by the collective bargaining agreement mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to inclusion as part of the last contract, one of the things we wanted to move to is the recognition that there is there can't just be a formulaic approach to staff in classrooms with, mm -hmm. with individual student needs. Mm -hmm. um, the first you know, word in the IEP is individualized and I think that's what needs to drive when we look at staffing. Mm -hmm. um, the, so as part of the new um, collective bargaining, any new inclusion program is a discussion that involves um, members of the staff mm -hmm. as well as um, the central special education team to review the, the special program. So it's no longer this sort of only formulaic approach of one teacher, one paraprofessional for 20 students. Got it. So um, the budget, this budget is reflective of the standing collective bargaining agreement with the Boston Teachers Union and what they are requesting in terms of staffing for a full inclusion classroom. Right. And so what we think, you know, our, it, it's hard for me to talk about this sort of publicly because we're in the midst of, of course, union of negotiations, but um, I will say that we, we do recognize that, that when it comes to full inclusion, we, we need to have a spectrum of services mm -hmm. and we need to be um, driven starting with the student needs of the students in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So one teacher and one paraprofessional is appropriate for many inclusion classrooms. Mm -hmm. And then there are other inclusion classrooms where we need to think about um, and staff them differently and that needs to be driven by the, the actual students in the classroom. Thank you so much. So uh, my next question is about transportation. Recently, a family who my office has been working with in my district was on the news because he um, regularly didn't know whether their children um, who have his children who both have complex disabilities um, would have transportation out of out of their out of their district uh, I don't need I don't need to you know since you just shared I don't have to see a piece of newspaper I also have an autistic son and my colleagues can attest to the amount of meetings that I miss and I am late to because the school bus didn't show up and I have to drive him to school every day um, not every day, but when the bus doesn't show up, I have to drive them to school. And so um, I, I you know, know from personal experience. And so can you describe how the budget is addressing current and projected bus driver shortages? I had somebody on my staff, and, and follow up question, I had somebody on my staff go on the BPS website, right, to, as if they were someone who was looking to be a bus driver at BPS. And it seems like um, it's very well posted on the transportation landing page but is not um, in the BPS jobs. And so is there any plan to make sure that the fact that one, there's a bus driver shortage and we need more bus drivers is being shown and how much more, if any, investment is included in this budget for transportation, particularly for you know students with IEPs and disabilities? 
I'll take that question. Ray Ketching, the Deputy Chief of Human Capital. Nice to meet, nice to meet you. you so much. Um, so we technically don't hire the drivers. We can partner with, they, they are hi, uh, employed by TransDev and we partner with them. Mm -hmm. So that's probably why you see it just on the transportation page as a, um, a means of advertising, but the actual hiring on of isn't a function of Boston Public Schools, but it is a partnership with them. Mm -hmm try to make sure we're And so that. because it's not a BPS job, it is not on the, that's why it's not on the BPS land. It wouldn't be on, uh, in our um, applicant tracking system, if you will. Mm -hmm. they, they don't actually apply to us. Okay. Is there any way to make, I know that they don't apply to you, right, technically, and so is there any way to make the announcement? You know, even if it links to their page and it brings them somewhere else, I think that having that like prominently placed somewhere would be helpful. It's obviously not a budget discussion, but <laughs> just yeah. to. No, I, I, I'll take, take note. Okay. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, because the mic is there, it goes, yeah, thank you. Sorry, in terms of driver recruitment and hiring, mm -hmm. um, so as you can see, the, the flyer is on the transportation yep. website. Mm -hmm. Our communication team um, has posted uh, the driver recruitment information mm -hmm. on BPS platforms. Mm -hmm. The bus drivers, like Ray Catching said, are TransDev employees, so it, doesn't flow, it wouldn't flow through our talent ed system. Um, we are also partnering with finance, like Nate and his team is supporting us with um, additional funding to do additional um, recruitment for drivers. Mm -hmm. um, we're, our internal team um, in transportation does have a working group with TransDev who's also um, have additional staff that's supporting with recruiting drivers. The problem that we're facing right now with recruitment, we've. Um, we've been able to recruit the most drivers that we've ever historically recruited um, uh, for Boston Public Schools. However, as fast as we're recruiting drivers, we're losing drivers. Currently, we have over 210 drivers that are out on leave. Yeah. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, that was my time. Uh, yeah, we'll, we're doing second rounds, and we're going to be quick because we only have four people, four of us, so we'll Thank get you. another seven. Um, Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, uh, so we get three rounds, y'all. So questions are just gonna get spicier. Um, all right. So I want to kind of follow the thread a little bit around um, students with special needs and disabilities, intellectual disabilities, all types who are getting door-to-door -door service. I heard uh, from a uh, someone in East Boston. The name will be um, protected. Uh, that uh, there are some high school students with intellectual disabilities that do get door-to-door -door service right now, but that there's a, a push and an initiative to also provide them with M7 so that they can start learning how to be independent. So I'm just curious if you're familiar with that situation and what, if anything, can we do to help support students on that track and provide them with the M7s that they need to learn how to um, take the bus? Oh. Thank you um, for that question, Counselor. We are currently working with the Office of Special Education. So currently there's uh, travel training programs um, for high school students, uh, high school door-to-door -door students. Um, and the Transportation Department provide T-passes to high schools that are a part of the travel training program to support those students. However, um, we are currently partnering with uh, Special Ed. We have a working group in place where we are working on expanding that program where we actually assign passes to those students going forward um, to support them to, uh, getting around uh, on the MBTA. Um, we are currently writing up the guidelines for which students would get those passes assigned starting next school year. Um, so that's a work in progress at the moment but we already started the conversations. Okay, so then it is fair to say that potentially some of the folks uh, who have been advocating for this in East Boston will see this yes. come to fruition. Okay, thank yes. you. Um, so I'm gonna move to, because I know we're gonna do a third round, but I wanna um, focus some of my time um, around public safety, and then um, hopefully I'll have some other questions. So I know you mentioned some of the groups that you've been working with, and I'm just curious what role, if any, 
um, have you had with uh, the Youth Development Network? It's a program that helps support students who are chronically absent. And sometimes what I've heard from a lot of students is that they don't, um, that they have beef with, with certain people that they're just not gonna go to school or they're afraid to. And I've heard from principals and educators who have actually had to pay for Ubers and Lyfts to get students to school because the, um, they just are not feeling safe. And I know that chronic absenteeism is something that we've been talking a lot here on the council. So I'm just curious from a public um, safety perspective if you could talk a little bit about that. Then, you know, I would not be Councilor Mejia if I didn't call this out, but you know, you mentioned something that was a little bit triggering for me. You mentioned, um, you said those people when you were talking about the recruitment of, of black and brown and Latinx and you know, just folks in general. And I think that um, I tend to be a little bit hypersensitive to language um, because I think the way we present ourselves, whether it's our intention or not, can land in ways that make people feel certain kind of ways. And I think that Bill sizing us sometimes you know, it's just something for us to be super mindful of as we, you know, um, talk about recruitment in particular. So I just kind of want to name that. And to that point, I'm just curious, like, how many black, Latinx, female um, folks are part of the, um, the staffing and how many actually live in Boston. And I also know that, um, you know, the rate of pay makes it really hard for recruitment. Um, and I'm just curious what efforts are being made to help support um, the staffing uh, rate, pay rate specifically. And then um, some of my other questions are in regards to bullying and harassment. I've heard from um, families at the McCormick and different schools across the city of Boston that when it comes to bullying and harassment in particular, um, that there is, seems to be a disconnect in terms of information and how things are being processed. So I would love if you could just speak to me a little bit about kind of like what is the policy and, and, and what that looks like. And then lastly, because I know my time is gonna run out, is that I'm really curious around this, the racial tension that exists right now here in the city of Boston. Um, there are some folks who are pushing for metal detectors in our schools, so I'm just curious to know how many schools have metal detectors, which schools have them, what is the, the school culture and climate of that, and do you have any research or data that um, can talk about how students feel when they walk into spaces and places that um, have metal detectors and um, what you know about that and what are you doing to uh, reconcile with it. That's a lot, but you can take whatever you want and I know that counselor, uh, the chair will allow me my third round for any follow-ups. That's a lot. said it, I kind of realized there was probably not the proper word to use, and it wasn't my intention to offend anyone by that. Um, as Thank far you. as the youth development, um, our office per se is not involved with the attendance. There are attendance offices. They're in the different um, departments, and they look, work with the schools closely on attendance issues. I'm not sure, Sam. Yeah, I would just have to, I would, I would uh, introduce. Yeah, I want to be really clear about what my question is, Sam. You got my question? I do. Okay, um, I, I asked uh, Jillian Kelton, Assistant Director of Safety Services, to come down, who works on a lot of our prevention and intervention work, who does work closely with YDN, and they can speak to that part Okay, of thanks. Um, yeah, so your question, Councillor, I, I think what it really comes down to is knowing our students um, and creating those holistic wraparound services that really involves a deep partnership with community agencies like YDN. Um, on top of working with YDN, we also partner really closely with organizations like YOU, ROCA, SOAR, mm -hmm. um, Boston Public Health Commission. And when students have concerns around their safety and how it then impacts their attendance and their forward academic progress, we look to really establish a strong relationship with the parents. We understand that we also at times need to lean on our community partners, so that's where my role really comes in, um, to make case-specific support plans for those students to be successful. Um, and we work really closely with the Office of Attendance in doing so. Um, a lot of our work is preventative, so knowing how our students need to be supported outside of school is um, really part of educating the whole student um, and understanding that our responsibilities don't just end at the school walls, but they extend out into the communities. Just briefly to touch on some of the other questions that you mentioned. 
diversity staff in the safety service office. We have 44% black um, safety service specialists, 30% of Latinx, 26 are white, 72 are uh, male, and 28 are female. Right, so can you talk to me a little bit about, of, of that, can you talk to me about the language diversity? Sure, so um, the bilingual staff include Haitian, Creole, Spanish, and Portuguese speakers, and English obviously as well. Um, and in regards to their rate of pay? Um, I'd have to get the exact number unless you have the average salary for that. We could pull that up. Because I know there is a connection with, with like how much you pay people. That'll increase. And, and we, we, we can pull up the average of the current average salary for that as well, if that's helpful. And, it's, and just speak a little bit to the um, the metal detectors um, as well. You, you had, a, had a question yep, about that? Yeah, and then I, I also want to talk a little bit about the tri uh, some schools that have um, identified um, driveways being used um, as pass-throughs and kind of like what some of the security issues are around that, as well as I want to talk a little bit about some of the schools that have parks next to them and the safety concerns around, you know, needles in the park and kind of like how, we're, how are we as a city supporting BPS? Because again, I'm going to say this, they expect you all to do everything and Council Lada has been really great at uplifting that it's going to take all of us, right? So, you know, what can the city um, budgets do to help support some of those initiatives? Sam, this is a budget hearing. This is an opportunity for you all to tell us what we need to be doing, not just to sell us on the things that you want, but like, what, where are the, the gaps, right? So that when we are meeting with other departments, we can just say, well, what about this? What about that? So seize this moment. Oh, I'm about to. Thanks okay. for opening that Thanks. up to me, please. I appreciate that. So just to speak quickly about the uh, metal detectors, those are um, put in mainly high schools and some lower grades and also as requested by schools um, as well. And we have discussions with the staff as well as students before we do that. And the families, because I, I just want to make sure that people are getting what they want mm -hmm. and that we're not, cre like Councilor Lada was the one, I'm, I'm actually stealing a line from your playbook right here. Um, Councilor Lada made a really good point during our public uh, our town hall around mm -hmm. public safety is that if schools want that and families and community they should they should put those in the schools that they want right as as opposed to uh, um, forcing it and in, in certain neighborhoods and I just think that that was a really valid point um, so I'm just curious if you can speak to that yeah sure so we do have schools that don't have them um, because of some of those reasons as well and some of that engagement um, so there is a variety of schools that have them and don't have them for that very purpose. So um, I, I just, I, high level, that's kind of how I describe that. But to some of my requests and coordination about the driveway pass rules yeah. and the um, parks and needles, um, that's where we really need to rely on our partners um, with other city departments as well as community, right? So I can cite you two schools that I know of off the top of my head that about a month ago, we had to work real closely with, this, with the city and um, transportation department, parks department um, to really talk through how to um, control some of the traffic driving on and around our property. So a lot of that tends to rely on community engagement. So before we can make any plans and adjustments to some of those spaces, we have to one, understand what those spaces were originally designed for and are used for. Um, and we have to demonstrate why it's a danger to our school property and school communities, and then bring it to the community to have that discussion about how we can restructure all to some of those spaces. So we're currently in the process of developing proposals for two schools that I know of specifically, that we're preparing to bring out to the community to have those types of discussions. So those are some serious concerns that we do struggle with as a BPS, but that's, it's not an independent BPS problem because we rely on so many other folks to help us resolve the problem and have those community dialogues and work with our, with our colleagues. So what would be helpful if I could work with each of you in each of your districts, so if I know a specific school that's in your membership district, I can work with you closely so you can help us um, navigate those conversations. Thank you. I'd love that. Thank you, Sam. Um, is my time up? Oh, I don't know if you remember your the clock went off and oh, it did. a while oh, back. Sorry, oh, that's sorry. Okay. That's Sam's fault. He took up the time. Fault. No worries. Um, I think, so, I mean, obviously in terms of like the um, topics that we are discussing today, um, what I'm hearing, I mean, and by the way, Sam, I, I reviewed and I think Councilor Ralph um, took it, but I reviewed, uh, what, do you, what were you calling that, the circular? No, that was a memo that I put out, not a, a memo. Circle. That was just a memo, but that's, yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, no worries. Uh, the, in terms of your memo, um, it, 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 was, it was not harm reducing. Um, it does not include the agencies that do that or the services that do that. So I, 
I just, it was all safety in terms of like criminal justice, like BPD and who to call. And I know, I know, I know. It was that's just procedural. It was a procedural memo very intentionally. There, I got there are you. others that are not. I got you. Okay. Um, we would like to see something that is more around what we're talking about here. Happy that Friday. includes, you know, each step and where people are intervening. Where is the best team? Where are the liaisons? Where are the social workers? Where, because I think, and, then, and that's not just on you, that's a collaboration for the whole school to say, you know, what is, um, what do they call them? Action plans? Um, what is the action plan in, ter in case, in, in terms of each incident or types of incidents? Yeah, so if you recall a Monday afternoon's hearing, um, our social emotional learning presentation, um, based out of that, we're gonna give you some of that information. I also just wanna note that some of our memos in um, circulars are very procedural, very intentionally, because some folks on the ground need to know, here's what I do in certain situations, step one, step two, step three. Then there are others that are more, um, um, if I recall, what part, the conversation on social emotional? I apologize. Or the fact that that actually happened or did not happen? No, the part around just our general approach on how we approach our uh, harm reduction work and efforts and how the different uh, actions and different tiers and what we do. If I recall correctly, um, you guys- Let's were, marry the two. It, well, we, we do, but we need to show you how we do that. It's how I would describe it. I see. So we're getting it in separate. So can I- Exactly. Can, I would love to see it together so that- it, um, I can see the full wraparound that we talk about so sure. often. Um, and then, you know, with transportation, we talk about increasing diversity. Um, with food and nutrition, we talk about, you know, how it's a majority. Um, it, well, for me personally, it's about um, making it healthier, and I really appreciate the efforts, um, Naveen, and um, uh, the director, I'm sorry, I forget your name. Deb. Deb. Um, in terms of the plans to increase it, but I think that we would love to see that communication in the future in the websites in terms of what are the metrics, how are we actually making progress in building equity in the procurement as well as make, while, while making our food options healthier. Um, and then I would say uh, in terms of school safety, Sam, that's what I have for you. It's uh, marry the two programs and all of your collaborators or outside agencies or contractors in terms of um, harm reduction or how you're approaching this. Um, and then you probably get like a full curriculum of how you're implementing, um, how you're implementing uh, the whole child approach when it comes to safety. Um, we'd love to see that on the website as well. Um, and then how we're communicating that with parents. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the auditing or um, of safety cameras and all of where the spaces are, I would say open that up to the students. Um, when I used to work, uh, when I did third party um, FIFA service, I would have a lot of clients in schools. And I had one particular client, a little girl who was sexually um, abused in the hallways of Madison Park. Um, I had another one in Timothy, I had one in, Kim in, in McKinley. So needless to say, a lot of incidences in certain areas that are kind of like blind spots um, that kids are familiar with, um, that probably, they could probably be helpful in that conversation to ensure safety and implementing more cameras. Um, and obviously, you know, that the whole school is communicating in putting out like sort of campaigns around destigmatizing abuse, destigmatizing bullying, destigmatizing mental health. Um, would love to see your plans for that campaign as well in terms of like visual like you know literature I know that schools do this a lot the 90s I think is our really good example of how we did that really well We sent home toolkits, right? We had like all these flip books how to put on a condom remember those it was weird It was like a little guy. He would put it on as we flipped the book um, We did all of those right we did bleach kits. We did um, all these information and all this campaigning, we did commercials, we did DARE, and I think all of these services that we're talking about now are great, but I don't see kids really talking about any, like a campaign, and using social media, and how we're doing that. I would love to hear about that. Yes, yeah, so um, with regard to the marketing campaign, uh, our work with our uh, revised um, Boston Student Advisory Council, um, they've been a large part of our safety conversations and given us a lot of feedback on 
um, suggestions on how to market it and those pieces. So more to come on that because we're still working with the students on that piece. Um, but there is some engagement there. Um, we do uh, have a delicate balance of a conversation with the students when it comes to the cameras um, because they do inform us um, to an extent. The students that want to come forward and tell us that information do tell us. But we also have to be careful by not exposing too much of um, where we're putting the cameras because some kids will intentionally say, put it here, then they'll go over there. So we have to be uh, careful how we analyze it from the school leader perspective. And we recently added them to our safety committee planning work to, as we roll this camera work out. So there, the school leaders are at the forefront in advising us on what they know from the students already and, 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 and those pieces from their assessments and experiences and incidents that they've had. So that's ongoing as well. Um, but I like the idea about the campaign and the students are all over that and we're working closely with BSAC on how we do some of that stuff going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, and I know that I can speak for my counselors. We are open to um, supporting you with community engagement or listening sessions or ideas or po on a policy level how we can help. Um, I look forward to that. And then lastly, of course, procurement. We do, we're doing horrible, horribly in terms of contracting uh, minority and women-owned businesses. We're doing horribly and we have been for decades in terms of um, contracting inner city in, in state and um, really like that there's, there are initiatives and I'll stop there. Um, in terms of budget, I would think that the nutrition would increase in re irrespective of what's happening with federal funds, um, only because we need to get healthier, not, you know what I mean, not project our estimate and that's it, just what we need to do. But getting healthier means investing more in our nutrition, getting healthy, investing more in ath athletics, and we talked about that the last hearing as well. So, um, and you know, and it's obviously, like for me, it's obvious that the issue is not that you have, that you have too much money, but that you have more money, that, that you need more money, you need money. And so my position is that, you know, of course, so we're gonna like drill you in how that money is being used, um, and it may not sound like it's relevant to ways and means, but totally relevant if it's not informing our budget. And then of course, a lot about the metrics. I did sit with uh, Annie Quinn who gave me a lot of information on, you guys actually are doing this. And I, d I guess some of the, I don't know, maybe there was, I don't know. The, so some of the information that we were asking on metrics and demographics in terms of what the schools need and all of that stuff, that work is being done. And, I, and, and your, uh, some, uh, the, your department actually contacted us and started showing us that. So that, that's really exciting. Metrics and showing school by school what the need is and how you're addressing equity. Um, so I, 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 I'm excited for that and it, it felt like a disconnect earlier on in the other hearings when we were asking for those, those information and how to accessing them and I know that it's hard when you're sitting here and we're asking you questions and you have to look at the same time and you know, um, give it to us in real time. So um, hopefully again about the money, I think that we can't compare what the suburbs are doing to Boston because the suburbs, we know, research shows us that they do not deal with the same um, disinvestment in social determinants of health. And we know that here in Boston, uh, populations, brown and black populations, are highly disenfranchised in that um, sense. So we can't compare apples and oranges, though it's a totally different situation. Um, I, I've been very transparent. My kids went to Western Public Schools I mean, come on, you can imagine the facilities and you can imagine the environment, you can imagine the resources that a kid in Weston has and a kid in, in Boston has, right? Um, so I, I, I don't have that uh, position and although maybe my colleagues uh, disagree, or well, some of them disagree, I think that you need more money, but I think that we need to get, we can't take it personal when we're talking about equity, when we're talking about hiring people and respecting black and brown people and um, increasing in diversity. And we can only uh, partner to do that work more um, intentionally. Thank you. We've been joined by um, Councillor Flaherty. And to continue our uh, third round, we'll go to Councillor, um, back to Councillor Lara, then Mejia, then Councillor Flaherty. Councillor uh, Lara, I think that our time is going to allow us, e you three, each seven minutes. I've said my part, and then we'll close. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna continue my line of questioning around transportation. Uh, are, there, are the bus drivers unionized? 
Yes, our bus drivers are unionized and we're currently in contract negotiations with them. Beautiful. So before this contract negotiation, what was the rate? Would you like what is the rate that, that, that they're paid at and would you say that that's a competitive rate for bus drivers? Um, our bus drivers are paid twenty six sixty five an hour. Um, and they get a 25 hour a week guaranteed minimum. Mm -hmm. um, prior to COVID, um, our, this, it was a competitive rate. Um, mm -hmm. our, our bus drivers were paid in the 99 percentile, um, like compared to other bus drivers uh, around the country. And we did not see a driver shortage like other districts saw continuously mm -hmm. across the country. However, with the current labor market, um, we're seeing Peter Pan $10,000 sign-on bonuses, the MBTA. So, so we're seeing that um, there's uh, room to improve our, possibly to improve the amount of money that our bus drivers currently get paid. So in the scope of how many buses, how many bus drivers, Peter Pan giving $10,000 signing <laughs> bonuses, and uh, the fact that you're in the middle of contract negotiations, would you say that you have sufficient money in the transportation budget to incentivize people to come and work for us, to cover all of the positions that you need, and to make sure that every child in BPS is being picked up daily, and if somebody calls out, there is somebody there to replace them? Would you, you know? Sorry, Nate. Is there enough um, money in there? <laughs> um, in terms of in terms of uh, the recruit, I can speak to um, in terms of like the recruitment piece, mm -hmm. um, uh, and that piece is uh, it, it's also challenging, right? Mm -hmm. Because I would say that like we've been aggressively like recruiting drivers, yeah. but um, the average age of our bus drivers um, is about sixty four years old. Right. Um, <laughs> so, and and as fast as we're recruiting them, right, we're mm -hmm. losing uh, a number of drivers, yeah. um, but we're currently working um, with the finance team and we are getting like the support in terms of mm -hmm. like the finance pieces um, to, to continue like recruiting efforts mm -hmm. uh, to think about, but um, I can't speak in depth to some of those things because of the current contract negotiations that, that, it's, that are going on and mm -hmm. some of the recruiting pieces ties into um, the contract negotiations. Would you benefit from having more money in the transportation line item to say maybe not a $10,000 signing bonus, but would you benefit from, like, would you, do you think that your recruitment would benefit from having more financial resources than what you have in the budget now? Uh, sure. Um, we're currently... Just say yes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, help me help you. Help me help you. Can, can I, I and yes. at, the, at the risk of intervening at a point where, um, uh, you asking her if she wants more money. The, <laughs> I will just say the dynamics of the labor market have significantly yeah. shifted yes. over the last two years. Yeah. Yep. And so at the start of the pandemic, Good for we that. were able to retain a lot <laughs> of our- The socialist speaks. <laughs> the social, yeah. uh, we, we were able to l retain a lot of our lowest, lower paid staff mm -hmm. because as a city, we committed to paying our employees during the shutdown. Yes. So drivers, food service workers, mm -hmm. these are all incredibly important. This was an incredibly important thing for us to do as a city to stabilize our communities and continue to pay employees. The private sector did not do that in the same way. Mm -hmm. We stepped up and, and did that. Now we're in a place where the private sector needs to recruit very quickly and they're doing things like sign on bonuses. This is affecting drivers. This is affecting food nutrition services. This is affecting a lot of our different positions. Positions that um, the private sector is not necessarily dealing with collective bargaining, and so they can make a one-time mm -hmm. payment that doesn't have a lasting effect. I think we're in collective bargaining negotiations, so we should not talk much more about this, but yes. I think what, what this, is, this is an interesting area that in the last two years, it's almost been a 180 degree mm -hmm turn for us in terms of what we're having to deal with and respond to. Mm -hmm. um, and so the team has been incredibly agile and, and thinking and progressive, but um, 
I don't think a year ago any of us would have guessed that mm -hmm. this is the position that we would have been in. Yeah. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how to, how to respond appropriately, but it's been pretty tough. And then well, um, thank you. I won't talk anymore about, but if anybody, if anybody from the union is listening, <laughs> I think that, you know, and, and folks with EPS, you have a really amazing opportunity to be incredibly generous with the benefits and the package that you are providing your union bus drivers if you're trying to secure more of them. Um, I'm trying to see if I have another question. Uh, we're talking, we're having this conversation about school safety. Uh, do, are you funding any alternative, um, like alternatives to policing programs that are centered around the young people, like peer to peer programs or any of like transformative justice programs within BPS in any way that's different than how you were funding them last year? So the, the person that could answer that um, particular question just stepped out on an emergency. Okay. You know, I can, an emergency should be right back in, mm -hmm. Sam Dufina. I can um, ask I Sam separately. If, if, yeah. Sorry. I can ask Sam separately, okay. but you can yeah. answer, yes. So we're waiting for Sam to be able to answer that because that's out of um, either friend. Okay. And we're talking about um, the safety <laughs> service and stuff that he has been working on. Okay. Thank you. My apologies. No, no, absolutely. Thank you so much. No further questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Please make your way down to the catwalk. <laughs> um, so my, um, my daughter uh, um, is one of those picky eaters, right? And I've gotten some calls from the nurse, like she's not eating, food is not that great. I remember when I was um, a student in BPS, I used to have like warm corn and mashed potatoes. It was like good. What I used school to go was to that? <laughs> this was in the 80s, okay, girl. This was a long time ago. We even had home ec. Um, I, I had a good education. I can't complain about my little journey, even though it was underfunded, but nonetheless, I had swimming too. But I just remember lunch time being very different, right? Um, from the, the food that I got to eat to um, just the amount of time I had to eat. There's a lot of work that we need to do in both of those spaces. I just want to name that. But I want to just uplift what um, the chair was talking about in terms of culturally um, competent foods. And not to say that I want my daughter to eat rice and beans all day, every day, because that would not be a good look either. But I'm just curious and I'm concerned also about um, uh, issues around, um, you know, food disorders, like, you know, eating disorders because of just the quality of food that students have access to in our schools. So I'm just curious about if you, if you, have any correlation between eating disorders and the food that's being offered and you know not that you all are responsible for it but any of that data will really help in terms of advocacy right mm -hmm. so questions are specifically around um vendors and i know i i've, I've talked about this in all of my hearings mm -hmm. how do we break down these contracts and create opportunities for either restaurants or um local com local grocery stores that have more culturally competent foods, uh, there, there is an opportunity there, Sam, for us to, to look at how we can push the paper through to be more culturally responsive. So I'm curious what that looks like across all schools. Sure. Um, Trevor Fentricelli, I'm the Acting Director of Food and Nutrition Services for the Boston Public Schools. Um, we, just kind of two part, let me just, for your cult, regarding culturally appropriate foods, um, that is the weighs heavily on us. Um, we have, um, as I mentioned before, we have three chefs that we hired um, that are doing a lot of recipe testing to bring in different types of recipes um, that will meet the needs of all different types of ethnic groups. Um, we also look at different types of foods through our purveyors. Um, and we do um, testing tasting in schools. It's called Chef in the Dining Room. It's a new program that we started, and that's where we're doing sampling of all different kinds of food. Is that in all, across all schools? It's 125, so no, wh no. Where, where is this program at, and how do we decide where they end up? Yeah, 
So um, we just started it recently, um, maybe four months, maybe, maybe it was like late, um, late fall. Um, and it's, it's schools that we're cooking at, um, so we can cook these items there. And we're just, we're picking schools throughout the city. Which um, schools? I could send you the list, I don't okay. have the list, yeah. I'm just curious in yeah. terms of just Yeah, we were actually just at Madison Park yesterday. Because they have a program there. Yeah. Mustab, can you state for the record when you think you can send that list to her? I could send it to you today. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, and we've had meetings with students um, to get their feedback on the kinds of foods that they would like to, that they would like to eat. Uh, it's, we have com um, contracts, like individual contracts with local companies, um, North, North, North Coast Seafood, um, 88 Acres. Um, we've had... Um, Are those minority business owned? Are those owned by people of color? I, I'd have to... I'd have to look okay. exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so, and, and we're also, you know, working with local farmers to, to bring in fresh products uh, for the kids. Um, so regarding diversity in the menu, we, we do focus on that, and we are trying to make whatever changes we can based on student feedback regarding the time that students have to eat or the environment that you and I were used to. Mm -hmm. um, lunch time is very different than it used to be. Um, we, we are, we'd like to promote more time, but it's difficult as far as, you know, as a department. It, the schedules are really tight for educational time. It's not something that we control. Yeah. Um, sure, we wish it was more because it's a time to socialize, and we really want our dining rooms to be that dining rooms yeah. where kids can enjoy themselves and relax for half hour. Thank you, and before my time goes up, I just kind of wanted to also uplift that um, when it comes to the quality of experience, right? Not just the food, you know, I've heard from my daughter um, about milk that has been expired and, you know, I just think the same thing when we talk about facilities mm -hmm. and, the, and the buildings that our kids walk into and the type of environment and school culture and climates we create, also what we provide them to eat mm -hmm. also speaks volumes to how they feel about themselves, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm um, just curious about what are we doing, um, Sam, around some quality control, some accountability around some of these folks who think that they can just sell BPS expired milk and that we're gonna be okay with it. Can you talk to me a little bit about what the accountability looks like when those folks show up that way? Sure, we can. I'd be happy to answer that if I may. Uh, that was not expired. It w had a uh, sanitizing agent that they no, used. No, I wasn't talking about that specific incident. Oh, okay. I'm talking about, yeah, my, my daughter didn't tell me about that. I'm just talking about okay. other incidences where we've heard whether it was expired milk or okay. like little holes in quality apples. Control I'm curious about quality control overall. Yeah. I'm not naming a specific issue, just mm -hmm. okay. things that we've heard. Yeah. So um, as far as our vended meals go, we have them delivered to our, our facility so we can check them um, each day, samples of that. Um, we do have our staff check the um, expiration dates. Sometimes milk will spoil because it's maybe it's left on a truck or left out at a facility, and the date may be okay, but the milk is not okay. Um, and we do a lot of training with our staff. staff. We have monthly trainings with our staff, and we always do address food safety and food quality. My time is up, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Councilor Mejia. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as the Council's Chair on Public Safety, I wanna get back and just touch base on some public safety issues with respect to the school. Um, what, what is the percentage increase or decrease in the operating budget for school safety services? I believe the safety services um, from the conversation we had earlier is decreasing by 100,000, um, which was a position that is being repurposed from safety, safety officer to um, social emotional or a, a social worker position. Um, and that, <coughs> I'm not sure of the overall percentage, but I can look it up as you go to your next question if that's. Um, 
seems, seems to do a decrease, seems a little tone deaf in what's been going on in the schools, even if you just look at last week alone. But if you take from September to date, how many incidents have there been across the school district? I've got that data, Fran. Um, if, we, if not, we can give it to you. Well, we're waiting for that. Uh, we've heard, obviously, from students and families who are victims, and uh, Sam, you and I had talked about this at the hearing the other day, that they often feel like they're out on an island, um, whether it's because of Section 222 that you had referenced or the restorative justice practices that oftentimes the victims of the crime or the victims of the bullying and the victims of the assaults um, are the ones that actually are withdrawing from the school system as opposed to the one that uh, was sort of inflicting uh, or perpetrating. And so they sort of feel that um, they feel that the bullies get better treatment in the Boston public school system. So do we have a number of incidents? Um, just as of today reported was 1,925. Mother of God. Since September? Um, since the prior charge. So basically September, the school year starts. And, and we're, we're decreasing the safety budget? That doesn't, what was, what was the number the year before? Right. Only reported 420. What about the year before when we didn't um, have COVID? I don't have that right with me right now. Is it fair to say it's it's increased significantly? We, we should double check that data and get you back to the number. I don't want to inflame the situation, but is it fair to Thank say you. that the numbers are higher uh, this year than previous years non-COVID? I'd rather look at the data before I answer the comment. Right, so through the chair, if we can get that information. Sure. Sounds like a pretty staggering number since the beginning of the school year, over 1,000 incidents across the school district Council Clarity, and, and we're repeat, decreasing. Can you repeat your question, please, for the record, so that um, we can get a time on when it's going to return? Sure. The, the question specifically was how many incidents have there been um, in the Boston Public School system this year, and I think it was reported over 1,000 when compared to the year before it was lower in the 400s, but that was because of COVID. So Sam is going to get us maybe a five-year snapshot to see if there's been a significant increase because someone has to justify for me as someone that has the public safety lens for this body. Um, someone has to justify a decrease in the operating budget for school safety services. When I hear from parents across the city as an at-large counselor, I know that my colleagues hear from their respective um, constituents as well, that that doesn't seem to be how they're feeling. They're feeling that they don't feel safe in the schools and the parents don't feel safe in the schools. And when there are instances, the parents and those children are the ones that have to leave that particular school because they feel that the other individual, the perpetrator, the bullier, is getting preferential treatment. So uh, we need to sort of reverse that trend. Uh, looking at the office of superintendent, the protocols, examples of incidents where BPS officials must notify, must notify and report to BPD and safety services. There's a category, category has seven, um, seven examples. The first one is firearms and dangerous weapons. Uh, is bullets and ammunition, whether live or not live, is that, would that be considered firearm or dangerous weapons? Uh, yes, because y yes. All right. So if if it, if not Sam, then we need to add that because that's what's been going Let's make on. It clearer. Yes. yes, because we have missing and abducted children. No brainer. Sexual assault. No brainer. However, was uh, systematically ignored. EMS transports, medical evaluations, threats, and health and safety. But um, if there's a sort of a if there's a loophole there, uh, firearms and dangerous weapons. If that does not include bullets, live or any other form of ammunition. Uh, that needs flagging. to be included. Thank you. And the other, the other part on that is that um, when they notify, obviously, I, what's the policy on sweeps? BPS's policy on sweeps. Do they defer it to the Boston Police Department or do they get to say whether they want to sweep or they don't want to sweep? Just to be clear, it's always the call of the Boston Police. When they arrive on scene, they're in city command, they tell us what to do. In, in no circumstances at all um, should BPD um, uh, think that we recommend or deny any sweeps. Right. And a school leader should never be in a position to either um, accept or decline a sweep. BPD takes lead on all right. uh, initiated sweeps. Whether it's 9 in the morning or it's at school dismissal, BPD has that. And is that, and, and if uh, through the chair, if BPS can make that clear uh, to the Boston Police Department, because I think that in light of uh, what's occurred over the last uh, week or so, there's a little discrepancy as to sort of who has the call with respect to the whole building and the whole campus, as opposed to sort of the immediate sort of location where 
um, the item was found. And I think that would maybe clear up some of the discrepancy as to whether or not they're offering or it's mandated. I can continue to train, um, well, I can continue to communicate the, this with, um, with the Boston Police Leadership and also reiterate that to, to all of our That's students. great. And I say that because I, and you're familiar with that, I read a police report that said the Boston Police offered to have the K-9 unit sweep, and in the same police report, the school leader declined to have it sweep. So It was and, alleged that that was occurred, you know, and, and it's all alleged, and let me just for right. the record say that, right. but at the end of the day, BPD takes lead on all K-9 sweeps that are initiated. Right, and that's important to uh, make sure that when the, if that's, if that's gonna be BPS position or spin that you should take that up with the Boston Police Department in terms of whether or not it was alleged or if it was actual. And if I could ask for your support in doing the same with Boston Police Leadership. Fair enough, that's, yeah, that's a fair ask. As the Chair of Public Safety, I will make sure I reach out to Boston Police to let them know that they have full discretion when it comes to showing up at a scene where there's a weapon, bullets, or ammunition. They have to take control and, uh, and basically mandate a sweep. Thank you. You're very welcome. If we can just shift to, um, to transportation, can you tell me, provide me the number of students who we transport within the district and the total number that we transport outside of the district? What is the average travel time for students across the district? And can you talk to me about how we're managing our strategy around the bus driver shortage, not just locally, but obviously it's, it's a national issue, as you had referenced, uh, with the with the wages and signing bonuses and stuff like that. So if we can get a sense as to how many students we're transporting in district, how many students we're sporting out of district, the average time students uh, are on a bus across the district, as well as strategies to manage. Uh, we've seen, the, obviously, the stories recently about this, particularly our special needs students um, you know, waiting on the sidewalks, waiting for their buses. Uh, uh, someone recently had reported as, as recent as yesterday uh, a bus, I think it was an hour and a half late for their child uh, with special needs, so. So you have the floor. What are you, what are you thinking? How many are we transporting? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, we're currently transporting 20,873 students um, in total. Uh, 15,934 students are BPS students that we transport um, within the city of Boston. We have uh, 186 special out of district special education students that we're transporting, 4,518 charter school students, and 235 pri private parochial students that we're transporting. Um, in total, we're transporting to 231 schools wow. uh, within and out of the city of Boston. And are we getting reimbursed on the charter or the private parochial portion of that? No, so we're not getting reimbursed um, for charter um, and private parochial. Okay. Um, it's uh, the state um, mandates. State mandates that we transport uh, private and parochial students that live in the city of Boston. Um, so we don't get reimbursed. Right. It'd be nice if the state would factor that in with their local aid uh, and, and provide reimbursement for us. And then strategies around the bus driver shortage? Yep, um, so we have, uh, we started, to start off, we started off the school year with 649 um, bus routes on the road. We did an aggressive um, optimization of our bus routes and we cut down the number of drivers needed to 621. Um, we led an aggressive, rec well, not, TransDev led an aggressive recruitment process for drivers. They were able to hire 54 drivers, which is the most drivers that um, any contract, contractor have ever hired. Unfortunately, um, we had a large number of drivers either left or um, that, that is currently on leave. Um, with the competitive market right now, um, we're ramping up efforts, uh, so lead, uh, leading like large advertising campaigns, working with the finance department, um, which is supporting us with uh, figuring out other ways to um, recruit drivers. The, some of those efforts are tied up also in contract negotiations with the driver's union right now, so I can't speak to um, some of those efforts. Gotcha. And I understand that the, you can't dive too, many, too much into the contract issues, but clearly fuel and the price of fuel most recently has to be a huge factor um, in this particular bid and whether or not we'll have sort of a, a wide uh, a variety of companies pursuing it. So can you maybe just shed, shed the, the, the district's thoughts on the, f the fuel price? 
Um, so uh, we have seen a significant increase uh, in fuel prices um, that are that we're um, that I think on the on the uh, budget what's what was budgeted for um, we've seen those prices like significantly increase mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, the the IFB process and what um, obviously we're not complete we we haven't completed the process yet we're eighty percent in with the process um, and I think. Uh, with the increase um, in prices and just with inflation, um, uh, we're, we're going to see a lot of like the bids that come in that's gonna be significantly higher than we've seen in the past. Got it. If you could keep the chair obviously in the council informed as this budget process moves forward, um, if that number of the sort of what you guys are sort of forecasting, if that number significantly balloons, uh, those estimates balloon because of that, then I think that's an important um, item for, for the chair and for her committee and for the council to, to be aware of, so uh, thank you. I don't know if we're having another round. I know I heard the buzzer go off, Madam Chair. I just have one question on um, schools, on the um, residency investigators. Go ahead, Matt. So just briefly, I obviously want to give a shout out to the residency investigators. I think they provide, uh, uh, the, uh, play a huge role for our city. We obviously should be uh, educating and serving Boston residents. I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Council Mejia, uh, who I know had talked about residency investigating and her efforts uh, led to, I think, students being returned. Um, and I just, I was a little perplexed to hear that because as the district, our goal clearly is to not disrupt student learning. Um, and in this particular instance, during the investigation, I believe that they had removed students from the school only to, I think, Council Mejia's efforts were able to get those children back to the school. So I, uh, I don't know whether or not we've, we've if that's the process or if we've learned from that incident while the investigation is going on, we're not disrupting uh, the teaching and learning portion of it until the investigation has come to a conclusion. And again, um, Council Mejia's efforts, I think were on behalf of uh, her constituents and the council was, uh, it was great to hear that uh, that, that decision was reversed. Yeah, I, we, go ahead, go ahead, Lisa. Okay, I can speak to that. Um, and I do want to thank Councillor Mejia's office for intervening and helping us navigate. Um, and they helped uncover information that we did not uncover. Um, our information appears faulty. When we worked with the family, we did think the case was closed because we had extended um, opportunity to provide new information three different times. And so we, we did think that it was closed. We, from the time they were supposed to um, be unenrolled, we extended it each time by an additional week for three more weeks. So we, we did try to provide that flexibility and at the same time, I think we have learned something about the process and about uncovering um, accurate and adequate information that supports the family. Good. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, May Councillor Flynn, sorry, President Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just want to f follow up on a couple of questions. I've been here for a few rounds. Um, the food access issue, certainly we provide each child with a nutritional food during the school year. What are we, what are we doing during the summertime, especially for residents in, in public housing, students in public housing, um, you know, that that card you provided during the pandemic was helpful to a lot of a lot of students and their families, but the summertime also is um, an important time for learning mm -hmm. and, for, and for being healthy. Um, but what are we doing in the summer for um, students in food access? Um, Deborah Ventricelli, Acting Executive Director of Food and Nutrition. Um, so in the summertime, we have a summer program and we usually have it at about 100, 150 sites. Uh, most of them are open, so a student can go, age 18 or below, uh, or younger, um, can go and get a breakfast and a lunch throughout the summer for free. Okay, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. um, when are you gonna publish, publish that list of um, sites? So um, we're, we're working with di different organizations within the city, there will be a a map um, that uh, Project Bread puts out, and that's, that'll be on our website. I think it's on the city website also. And it shows all of the different locations. We still have applications coming in for people that are interested in being a food service site. 
And if you remember, President Flynn, we um, also agreed that we would provide you a list of those food sites that are close to the um, housing projects in your districts as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, that would be great. I want to, um, if we're able to provide that list to all the councilors, sure. um, because I know the councilors would want to send it out to um, their their neighborhoods as well. So I think sure. that's a that's a great program. Um, the, the the final point I wanted to make is. I haven't heard too much at all about the JROTC program. I'm not sure if we specifically have a a session scheduled for that, or or or, or here's my question anyway. Um, I think it's one of the best programs in BPS. I don't think there's a more diverse program in the city of Boston than the JROTC program. It's not about the military it's about citizenship it's a it's these ki these students doing um, a lot of community work the students are doing a lot of interaction with actually city officials they're marching in parades they're helping out at various neighborhood uh, nonprofits and these kids um, really do a tremendous job in my opinion they work hard but there are no plans at all to cut the JROTC program, right? No, sorry. Please. No, there's uh, not. Is there a plan to increase the program? There is no planned expansion of our JROTC for next year, no. And, and that's, and, and just to be a little uh, expand on that, we do have to work closely with the armed forces that we do partnership currently with in order to make that decision because it's a, it is a cost share, if I remember, correct, if I remember correctly. And, and, and I believe the armed forces pay a percentage of the salary, but it, it, they pay about two thirds of the salary. Is that is that accurate? My understanding is they pay half the salary. They pay half the, the salary. Position, yeah. So if someone's making a hundred thousand, the military will pay fifty grand. They pay. It's called a, a minimum a minimum pay. So it depends on your grant. Could be ninety thousand. Could be seventy thousand. Okay. But it's also. Um, but if your credentials and you come in uh, under the BTU contract and you're supposed to make 120, they're only going to give us 50% of the minimum pay for an instructor. So sometimes it can be 50%, sometimes it could be 40, but okay. they do give us a good chunk of reimbursement for it. Do you have, um, I, I would be interested in knowing if you could provide me the data of the ethnic breakdown of the students that participate in that? I'd like, I'd like to know that when, when, when you have an opportunity. Um, does the, who, who decides if the program is getting cut or not? Is it, is, is it up to the school or is it up to the BP, is it up to BPS? It's a partnership between the central office and um, the armed forces, so it would be uh, at the same time. Yeah, they have, each of the armed forces have like a, a sort of a regional director that says where the programs are deployed throughout their region. Um, and uh, right now, and so we would have to partner with them to see if we're going to expand it or contract it. So right now it's just kind of existing. Level funding. Okay. I'm actually going tonight to an event for the um, Excel High School, South Boston High School. They have a military reception at Florian Hall. And I think they're associated with the US, US Army. But I believe one of the students is receiving a scholarship to Boston University. Um, but I, I just have nothing but great things to say about the JROTC program. And I just hope no one is, is thinking of cutting the program. Um, because I think it's the most effective program. And if people are thinking about cutting the program, could they come and talk with me before they, before they do it? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's probably the most diverse program in, in the city, and I just wanna make sure those students have the same opportunities as, as any other student. Um, that's, that's all I have to say. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the BPS team for, for being here. Thank you, uh, Councilor Flynn. Um, I'd like to just ask uh, my counselors if you have uh, questions. We're gonna go around for closing remarks or any questions. Uh, just press your button on your mic. 
Council may hear you have before. Yeah, so thank you. Um, kind of want to just uh, really quick in regards to the questions around the uptick around bullying and harassment. I think I did ask a question around kind of like the response um, turnaround time and kind of like just the work that happens in that space. So I appreciate my colleague lifting it up. But I'm just curious, um, as a result of uh, COVID and the social and emotional and mental well-being of, of students, I'm going to assume that the decrease is also to help support, right, on the mental health and wellness front, which is, is that why we're, is that what? That's exactly correct, yeah. Okay, um, and because we are moving in towards a culture where we are really grounding ourselves in the lived realities of, of our little kids who are bringing so much into these classrooms, right? That's right. Okay, great. So I just want to be clear that that, that is the correlation between the situation, right? Yeah, and to, your, to your point and uh, Madam Chair's point, um, that's the synergy that we talked about, the, the overlap that we're trying to create and, and make sure that's there. That is one of the glues as, as piece of the puzzle. Great, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and you know, I, because of the way the chair opened up, I'm just so super like, mindful of how I, um, how I show up in this space, but I think, and I don't really care because it's important for me to show up as I am. I'm not gonna leave myself at the door. But I just think it's really important for us to note that when we're talking about public safety issues and concerns, that racial abuse is part of public safety. And we often don't talk about that and how staff, teachers, students, and families feel in the spaces and places that they walk through um, when they send their kids to school. And I find it very, very interesting that just this week alone, the two specific um, uh, uh, incidences that my colleague um, referenced, one is um, the one in regards to the sweep and then the other one is the animation that, um, it, one is a principal of color, a black principal at Boston Latin Academy. Um, and then the other one is really working hard at trying to create a culture that is anti-racist. And I think that Boston, as we continue to navigate um, the work that the district is trying to do, I think it's really important for us to recognize that that tension is real, right? And in order for anyone here to do any work, that we all have to do our own personal work as it relates to a lot of the racial tension that exists, that has continued to persist here in the city of Boston. And that we can't have one conversation without acknowledging that that is also part of the conversation. And I, and I think, and I've heard from a lot of um, families, principals, staff, that don't feel affirmed um, in our schools. And I think that that's, there's some work to do. And if we wanna talk about safety, that is an emotional safety. And it may not be a gun in a school, but how you get treated and disregarded is abuse too. So I just wanna name that. And then in regards to the incident, Denise, that we intervened on, I just wanna be really clear. I think that we have an opportunity to shift culture um, because there were some judgments that were made about this individual's uh, status. Um, uh, the cohabitation, uh, and, and I think that, you know, I'm a single mom. My daughter's father and I were never married, right? Um, there's a lot of norms that, cultural norms that still show up in how we talk to families and assumptions that we make based on people's living situations. So I just wanna name that, that we need to be really super mindful of how that lands for folks, right? Um, because it could have been easily avoided. Um, and, and I think that judgment um, weighs heavy in, in how, we, how we communicate and interact with families. And I think that that is also some work that we need to do on our end. And it should not feel like you are trying to crack the Da Vinci Code when you're trying to get somebody in trouble. You know, and I think the little girls were scared because they thought that they put their mom in trouble. Um, and so, you know, there, there is some long-term impact of that, right? Um, and, and so I just, I just want to name that for the record, and I think it's important for me to, to, to say all of that. 
And then the last thing that I'll say um, is that as we continue to move through this journey and this process, right, um, I really do want you all to see me as a partner. And because I ask you these questions, is because it's my responsibility. I hope you all know that, right? Um, and I'm tired of this us versus them mentality that exists here in the city of Boston, when in reality, it's the council that approves this budget every year. And we need to be responsible for those decisions too. Um, and, and so that's why I know for me, we're being super, uh, our office is being super intentional about making sure that we are trying to set you up for success. Um, and figuring out what, what the need is. But I would like somebody to talk to me about the racial um, construct that exists and continues to exist in BPS because that impacts your staffing. People don't wanna work in a system that they don't feel affirmed in. So could somebody talk to me about what are we doing to not only re um, retain talent, but keep them there? And could somebody talk to me about how we're helping to keep families um, in our schools and understanding that that racial tension is a part of a lot of the reasons why some families don't feel safe there. Let's just name the elephant in the room, y'all. Let's just lean into it. Who wants to go first? I'll just speak for me as a black man in this district and as a black man that grew up in Boston um, and as a black man that's gone through the system as a student and as a, as a teacher and as a school administrator in the central office, racism is really real. And um, a lot of efforts that I think over the years we've done centrally has, have made some improvements and we started to chip away at it. Um, and it's frustrating to a lot of people um, in BPS Central, at schools, on the ground, in the community, and it continues to exist. And unfortunately, there's um, um, a lot of frustration that we feel um, from um, a lot of people that are experiencing it, both from a school perspective, students, staff, and we have to do better at this work. And we have to do better at making sure that we call out instances of racism when it happens. We have to make sure that we're confronting it when it happens. And we have to make sure that we're doing as best we can to make sure we bridge those divides to make sure that people understand that we have to work together. So our Office of Equity has been really championing a lot of that work under Dr. Charles Grants' office. Um, he can speak more specifically to a lot of the various initiatives that we're doing, but when it comes to our recruitment, when it comes to bringing people on board, to make sure that our students are being serviced and um, supported um, by a, a diverse um, group of body is what's really necessary here. They can't just see black and brown. They need to see black, brown, yellow, Asian, um, everyone supporting. And I think that's where we have to get to in this um, city and in this budget that we pass every year to year for our schools. Can I add, um, thank you for that, Sam. Um, the one thing that I want to add, because uh, Rashawn and I were in a meeting yesterday with some other city agencies and partnerships that, as we're talking about how do we leverage other city agencies for recruitment and for, um, and, and what it boils down to, and, and this is on behalf of everybody here, because I think we're all on payroll, um, is we actually have to invest in people. So if I can't show up as my best self, I can't serve you as my best self. Right, so I, I'm, I'm, if I'm worried about I can't afford to live in the city of Boston, but I have a residency clause hanging over my head, I'm gonna struggle. If I, if I can't uh, afford uh, basic living arrangements, but you know, so it's hard, I have to be able to show up as my best self. So we have to, as a city, as the Ways and Means Committee, figure out how we can invest in people, the employees, um, so that we're able to do that. And, and don't expect us to do it on our, our own time, but well, we will do it on our own time, but um, that's where we're getting surpassed in the private sector, where they're able to offer flexibilities that meet your home needs, that meet your hobbies, that make you um, ready and willing to show up. And, and right now we're just, in the last two years, been just getting beat up, <laughs> right? So we have to figure out if we are gonna take a bold step and invest in the people that serve this institution so that we can continue to show up as our best selves. And I don't think we've ever made a bold step like that before. I think the people on the ground do it programmatically, but do we have any institutional structures that do that? Um, you know, so we have great people that write great trainings and deliver great messages, but um, it leaves with them when they get burnt out. 
because the city hasn't invested in it as a structure or an institution that continues to go. So um, I think it's going to start with figuring out how we invest more and the people that are supposed to be driving the ship um, so that we don't get lost, we don't get burnt out, we can show up as our best selves and take the hard days and the good days. But Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. I just want to touch on that. So the on the, reten on the retention side, so on the principal and the teacher retention, I guess how are we compared to other school districts with teachers that are in our system sort of trained and then for, as you referenced, maybe get burnt out and decide to move on. Maybe they go to a different school district or maybe they even leave the profession. Um, are, are we seeing any trends there? Yeah, we had a higher number of exits than... Um, last than you know the last couple of years so we we will have an uphill battle for this year um when it comes we had a higher number of exits for uh, under garrity but we're we're kind of holding steady i mean the one thing we do have working for us is we um you know our teachers contract we, we pay pretty well as it starts as when it compares to folks entering the teaching profession compared to our surrounding communities um, but again, when we look at the exits, and Rashawn will probably be able to speak to the data, the, you know, the details of when we do these exit interviews, is folks are just looking for a better quality of life. And what that means is, you know, the stress, the commuting, the cost. The, mm -hmm. So it's, it's the noise around it, you know what I mean, that we're yep. going to have to address. Um, so again, we have a higher number of exits, and I don't know if we'll unless we make some institutional <coughs> investments, if we're going to be able to com to combat that. Um, you know, it's, it's, we can recruit all we want, but we have to obviously build into it as well. So. You know, those exits, are they outpacing? So school, student enrollment, if I understand it, is like we're 7,000 students less than we were, say, a few years ago. So is that, are those, are those sort of gliding together, the retention and or need to replace because the school enrollment is dropping or? Are you seeing a different trend there? Um, our reduction in the number of teaching positions has not necessarily kept pace with the reductions in enrollment because the enrollment reductions are spread across all schools, grades, programs, and neighborhoods. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's actually not as common for us to lose an entire class worth of students mm -hmm. in a single school. Um, so you end up, it, the enrollment declines before you see the reduction in the number of teachers that are required. Okay. And then the uh, racial makeup of the student population versus the racial makeup of the teaching and staff. Do you have those numbers? Mm -hmm. We covered the, the numbers for um, teaching staff, um, excuse me, the number, student demographics, 43% uh, Latinx, 32.2% uh, black, 14.5% um, white, 8.7% Asian and 1.6% um, other are multiracial. For the staffing demographics that we reported as part of our BPS at a glance, um, of the roughly 4,500 teachers, um, including 2,000, um, in addition there are 2,000 paraprofessionals, administrators and other support staff. Um, the demographics of the teaching and guidance counselors, which um, Ray already discussed as part of the Garrity order, it's 22% black, 57% white, 11% Latinx, and 6% Asian. So we're not yet at a place where the teaching staff represents the same percentages as our um, students. And I would also just note that our student demographic composition does not match the racial demographics of our city either. Um, and so I think this is one way in which you can see race and racism as it plays out in our schools. And the 7,000 decrease, is there a <coughs> demographic associated with the 7,000 decrease? Is it spread across the board or is it? Um, it is spread across. I, I need to go back and look at it specifically when it comes to um, one of the things that was offsetting the decrease in sort of um, the enrollment overall was a decrease in new immigrant students. Um, one of the things that's happening with our seven, the, the, the increase is that, excuse me, the decrease in enrollment is that we're seeing fewer new students arriving in BPS 
um, in registering for BPS rather than an increase in the total number of exits mm -hmm. of students leaving the districts. Um, and so as a result of that, we're not seeing as many um, English learners and, and um, special education students coming in. So um, I'll, I can go back and, and, and look at the racial breakdown of the, the over that seven year period. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for the work you do. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if the gentleman came down to give a statistic, but um, I appreciate your time and efforts. Sure. Well, Council, I'll just add that you know we were we were making some real headway actually um, in our retention work um, before we got to COVID in terms of uh, reducing the percentage of our educators of color amongst all of our exits, and also even retaining our um, provisional uh, provisional teachers. And um, yes, and I'll agree with, uh, with Ray in terms of some of the reasons that people are exiting in terms of, um, in terms of work uh, flexibility, especially in the central office, because if you're, doing, um, if you're doing the same type of, for lack of a better phrase, cubicle work for the city that you can do for a private company, but they can give you, mm -hmm. you know, more, just more flexibility then that's what you know my colleagues have decided uh, you know um, have have decided to do. So um, yeah, so I think we'll be having all of these sort of conversations about what more we can do. But I just also wanted to add, which I didn't know if, if you knew that um, that you know the Boston Public Schools we only have seven percent of all of the teachers in Massachusetts, right? But we have thirty percent of the state's educators of color. And that includes 46 oh. of the black teachers and 20% of the Latinx teachers. In so Boston. I just wanted to give that perspective as you think about the rest of the Commonwealth. Right. Very interesting statistic. And then uh, lastly, I don't know if we, and this is probably something we should do, hopefully we are doing, if we're not, I would recommend it. Do we do sort of an exit interview uh, with um, teachers that are leaving and, 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 a, and a, what are the top three reasons they cite? Is it is it burnout? Is it school safety? Is it Union politics is it, you know, they don't like, you know, the school that they're in. Any idea what sort of would, would other than maybe an incentivized, you can go somewhere else, make more money, less headaches, and you get a, you get a bonus. Mm -hmm. Is there any other factor that we're looking at that to, to sort of maybe turn, turn that around for folks? Sure, yes. So what I have been doing um, in my role in, um, in serving our educators of color is offering an exit interview for any of our educators of color who have left the district. Um, and we've been doing over the past uh, a year and a half. And, um, and beyond some of the things we brought up, um, you know, what I have, uh, um, what I have seen is, um, is, you know, issues around uh, supervision. And so, you know, we're thinking um, about uh, those places. And I know that's why we fed up, you know, the need for, you know, more supports and trainings for our, you know, for our school leaders. And we've also asked the teachers around, around uh, uh, professional development and growth uh, and growth opportunities. So we're also trying to figure out well, what are the pathways and avenues for our teachers to to get into leadership spaces or to maybe do other you know um, other uh, other things either inside or outside of the classrooms. So I think growth, professional growth, is also one of the is also one of the the spaces that we'll have to continue to to, to look at because if you I suppose if you hit the ceiling here in the BPS, but someone else might be able to give you an opportunity, you know, to lead, then, you know, then that's another reason why, you know, someone may make a transition. Thank you. That was very helpful, very informative, and thank you all for the work that you do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Council Flaherty. Uh, Council Mejia, if you don't have any, if you, just two minutes, if you want to make any, a closing remark. We have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I just want to say thank you all, right, um, for, for being here as long as you have. That was a long hearing. Um, but I do believe in the spirit of us recognizing that we're all accountable to what happens or doesn't happen here for our kiddos. I think it's important for you all to continue to um, hold us accountable to, right? I think that these hearings are an opportunity for us to listen and learn and then go back and say, well, where are the gaps and what are the things that we need to be advocating for so that our, our, our students, our educators, our staff, um, you know, are well supported. So at the end of the day, um, we appreciate you and your work. And I always say that this is not hard work, this is heart work, right? The work that we're trying to do um, oftentimes require us to not get political, but to really be about the, what's at the heart of the matter 
on things. And I think those things you can't put a dollar amount on. No matter how much money you spend on professional development, people believe what they believe. And that's not gonna change unless we are really super um, intentional about creating policies um, that will help um, shift that. So I just wanted to say thank you to the chair for setting the tone for today's hearing um, and for everyone who participated. Look forward to um, our continued partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, in the last uh, a couple of weeks, maybe, maybe three, no, just a couple. Um, it feels like a month. Um, we, we, I thank you for being here, for doing your work, and for um, having the stamina to respond to us. Uh, for the record, we've received your responses to our questions. We've received your responses to the um, equity RFI questions, and we've received your, your answers to the RFI questions. In the last couple of weeks, we covered uh, an overview. We covered academics. Um, we went on to talking about enrichment, athletics, um, arts and music, after school programming, tutor, summary, um, summer learning, and partnerships. Then we discussed um, social emotional learning and student supports, behavioral mental health supports, homeless education resources, network trauma, crisis response, family liaison, social workers, schools, psychologists, nurses, early education in high schools. Um, we may have more questions about early education. To my uh, recollection, we spoke, spent very little time on early education, um, which is crucial as we can all agree. Uh, we spoke about operations admissions today um, and assignment system or build BPS, future capital planning. Rather, my stuff is getting a little bit mixed up, but um, we did cover uh, procurement, recruitment, staff retention, uh, BPS revolving funds um, that we did not necessarily touch either. Um, for my council colleagues, I'll be sending out an email to ask them if they have any further questions. As far as the hearing that we held, the, seeing that we got responses um, by email, I think that we may not uh, reschedule that hearing. Um, our first working session will be Wednesday, where we'll be discussing your, the answers to your questions. Again, if we have further questions, we'll be sending them out. Um, we, with this, um, the first year where we have the amendment to the charter, um, we will be discussing uh, whether or not we want to follow. We understand that it, it's according to certain acts of certain years and uh, there are certain protocols that we have to follow. Um, and then we will be in close communication. For people listening at home, or watching this, if you have any questions at all on all of the topics in BPS that we've covered in the last couple of weeks, please uh, be sure to email um, my office or the emails that we listed uh, at the commencement of this hearing. Uh, but my email is tania, T-A-N-I-A dot Anderson at Boston dot gov. Um, and we, we hope to be able to work on those metrics, understanding um, what the needs are, but um, in working with an equitable lens, as well as communicating them on the websites. Uh, we really appreciate, I appreciate, and I know that uh, my council colleagues agree, on the initiatives. Um, I think that people, the initiatives that you've already created or implemented, um, I think that all of my council colleagues can, can agree that people work with the resources they have. And it sounds like a, very, a, a super, um, it's sort of stress uh, inducing type of uh, challenge for us to all look at this in a organic way and how we're going to address equity. Um, and hopefully we do that um, in camaraderie and not uh, offending one another and hopefully while there are sensitive topics that we need to have in terms of how we ensure equity in BPS, um, that we do that um, and allow space for people to feel comfortable to express uh, their sensitive areas, but also open to holding each other accountable. I have 
nothing else to say. Uh, Council Flaherty, if you have any closing remarks. Um, if not, if I would, I, I would ask uh, the panelists today if you have anything to say to close before we adjourn. Mm -hmm. No, I just want to thank you, um, Chairwoman, and, and to the Council for your questions today, and we look forward to, we do have one more hearing, I believe, on um, the 31st to talk about facilities in Bill UPS, and we'll look forward to um, that hearing. All right. Um, thank you. I thought, I thought this was it. Let me look at the schedule. <laughs> on the 31st, huh? How did we get VP facilities all the way down there? Okay. 31st at 10 a.m. Um, we have more to come. All right. Thank you so much, and I will see you guys on the 31st. Thank you, Madam Chair. Meeting adjourned.